Hit it. It's Friday, November 4th, 2022, episode 199. I'm Patrick Sresna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we welcome back to the show Vincent De La Wild from Stonex. Vincent comes back to the show to give us an update on inflation. Hint, he doesn't see it coming down as much as you might think. More importantly, Vincent outlines his new trade to take advantage of this persistent inflation. Then it's time for talking charts with our very own Patrick Ceresna. Patrick is suffering from his own version of hand and mouth disease. That's where he tries to draw crayon lines on his chart while also chewing on the underused colors from the Crayola pack. But we still get some technical analysis from him. We then end with our segments of no stupid questions and skin in the game. And folks, uh, we might even drink some beers along the way. So stick around. We got a great show. Lena, hop on. Uh, what uh, beer am I drinking this so week? So this week, Patrick is drinking Founders Brewing Company's Backwoods Bastard Bourbon Barrel Aged Scotch Ale. Mm. Oh, that's a good name. <laughs> no, honestly, it's, that's a good name. Doesn't roll yeah. off the tongue, or at least, or at least Lena had a little bit of trouble. Why don't you try again? <laughs> I can't say this again. This is a tongue twister. <laughs> but let me read something about the beer. <laughs> Expect lovely, warm smells of single malt scotch, oaky bourbon barrels, smoke, sweet caramel, and roasted malts, a bit of earthy spice, and a scintilla of dark fruit. It's a kickback sipper made to excite the palate. I, I can't, I'm I'm yeah. said I don't have this, Patrick. Yeah, no, you know what, though? It's interesting because... It uh, it has so many amazing flavors, but it doesn't taste like a beer. It, really, it, it like uh, it tastes it's, more like a bourbon. <laughs> well, no, it's yeah, it's it's so smooth drinking that it it doesn't have that kind of um, uh, that that beer taste in it. Anyway, it's it's, it's very much like beer, a beer. It doesn't taste like beer. <laughs> Where did you get this? Uh, actually, I got this in Seville, Spain. Ah. It's, okay, well, we'll uh, talk it, about I, that later because I want to yeah, know yeah. how you liked it. All right, let me do the side effects. Nothing yeah. in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in the show. Side effects of too much huddle may include, and we only have one today, irritable Powell syndrome. Yeah, that's a big uh, one, the, the lack of side effects, I think, is a punishment for us going every second week from our listeners. That's entirely possible. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's get to the interview with Vincent. It's our great pleasure to welcome back to the show Vincent De La Wild from uh, Stonex. He's a market strategist, and he's coming back for a little bit of a victory lap because when he was on our show last time, he was uh, calling for inflation. And sure, it was one of those cases where you you got to be careful what you get it or what you ask for because you might just get it good and hard. Vincent, thanks for coming back on. It's always a pleasure, and I want to say it's not just my victory lap; it's yours also because you have been in that. <laughs> Inflationist I came for for quite some time, and uh, we were a lot lonelier two years ago. <laughs> yes, that's right. We were a lot lonelier two years ago. I like to joke that even the blind squirrel finds an acorn every now and then, and that's probably in my case what happened. Um, but in your case, it's not. You had the, you had a theory, a, a, a plan, a kind of a reason for this occurring, and one of the things that you thought was that inflation is going to end up being the solution, not the problem. So I was wondering if you could kind of sketch out why you think that, why you th- believe that over the next decade we're going to get a, year, a kind of 10 years of 5% inflation, and, and we'll walk through kind of your inflation argument. Well, thank you for the, the question, and the, I, I appreciate it because I, I often get lumped with uh, some of the inflationistas on, on Twitter, and it's not always company that I want, you know, it's guys with, with laser eyes or guys who are trying to sell gold and who've been, right. you know, calling for inflation for the past 40 years because the Fed printed too much money and the dollar is going down. Um, and, and my take on inflation is uh, is somewhat different. Uh, so there is a, uh, an, a, a positive case, meaning just describing what happens, uh, and a normative case uh, describing uh, what I think should happen and is good. And, and that both these cases, to me, contribute to my uh, view that inflation is going to be in that 5 to 10% range for, for a decade. So do you want me to start as to why it's going to be like, like that or yeah, sure. as let's, to why let's, it's a good let's, thing? Well, well, let's start with why you believe it's going to occur, and then we can follow up with why you think that's a good thing. And, and then from there, I do have some questions and some ideas, and, and kind of I want to probe a little further about how the path is going to play out. Okay, uh, great. So um, I think to understand the inflation of the 2020s, 
uh, you have to understand the disinflation of the past uh, 30, 40 years. And um, I put the start date somewhere in the early 90s or only late 90s, depending on, on what we're looking at. I think one of the uh, pivotal moments for, for the inflation trade was the uh, Chinese devaluation of the RMB in 1993, 1994, uh, by a cumulative um, 70%. And then... By way of consequences, that led to the devaluation of Asian currencies during the the East Asian financial crisis in the late 90s. Uh, And and really what this did is that it ushered an era of secular disinflation in in goods and and tradable things like toys, like garments, like electronics, computers. I mean, if you look at the the categories in the US CPI, there really is a break in the mid-90s. And that corresponds to basically China. Uh, entering the uh, the global economy and, and Walmart bringing in the Chinese price uh, to the U.S. customer. And, uh, of course, that was magnified uh, by uh, a massively undervalued exchange rate. Um, so what happens in China in the late, late 80s is that they see that you know, the, Chinese Union, the Soviet Union is collapsing, they have their Tiananmen revolt, and they, they don't want to go the way of Gorbachev. So they, they decide, okay, we have to generate jobs and, and growth very rapidly. And at the time, the Chinese economy is more than that of Spain. So the only path they had was to open up the economy, dump the currency, and become the manufacturing hub for the rest of the world. And um, and also close the capital accounts, meaning they would take money from abroad, but... but, but, but they wouldn't give it back. Correct. <laughs> correct. And that, that kind of became the Chinese model of, of kind of export subsidies. And, you know, the first order effect was felt across the region uh, with the East Asian financial crisis, right? 97, 98. Uh, first, it's, it's, it's in Thailand, then Indonesia, then South Korea. And then they all run in the same problem. You know, basically, you're, you know, you suddenly competed with 1.3 billion people with a massively undervalued currency. I mean, you're going to have a balance of payment crisis. Uh, and, and the way you get out of it is by doing the same thing as the Chinese, right. which is devalue currency by 80%. I mean, there it was done by the market rather than, than by government fiat, but the result was the same. So very rapidly, you end up with about 2 billion people who are uh, working very hard with very undervalued currencies and tightening their belt so that they can acquire currency reserves which, which these currency reserves are then flowing back into the U.S. Uh, via the treasury market. So you get a double subsidy, really, one in terms of cheap goods yes. and one in terms of a cheaper cost of capital. Right. Um, and then the, the, the last bit that I'm going to add to this was what happened with Mexico. Um, so, and I think it's also partly a result of the Chinese evaluation is that by 94, 95, we have what's called the tequila crisis, uh, where, you know, the kind of, High growth period of Mexico ends in tears, big bust. Uh, this is happening just as Mexico has a huge bulge of young workers. Birth rates in Mexico in the 70s were very, very high, about six children per woman. Uh, so a lot of Mexican men are coming of age and, and the economy is in shambles. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the US economy is experiencing the great moderation. And again, Keep in mind, the first time we hear the term great moderation is 1995. Again, okay. all these elements are linked, right? So in the US, it seems that we can miraculously grow without an inflation. Now, the, the cause for that is the China shock, but you know, Greenspan being Greenspan, he kind of you know, <laughs> thinks it's because of his own genius. Of course, the, 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 he's a central banker. Of course, he's going to take uh, the good things are him and the bad things are someone else. Absolutely. But the point is, is that the U.S. had the capacity to absorb all the success labor from Mexico. And from the mid-90s to 2010, we have about 12 million uh, workers from Mexico that cross the border. And, and these are, you know, young, healthy men who are uh, very easily integrated in the historically Hispanic south of the southwest of the United States. Uh, you know, they have cousins, connections, and, and that is massively deflationary when it comes to wages uh, in the service and, and agricultural sector. Right. So you get cheap goods from, from China and East Asia in general. You get China and Europe success savings recycled through the capital account, and you get cheap labor from Mexico. Right. It's no surprise that for 30 years, we didn't have an inflation problem. If anything, the problem was, how do we get to 2%? Right. Uh, we, we had to oh, I, I remember those discussions that people were actually talking. Well, are we going to be able to hit our target to the upside, not to the downside? Absolutely. I, one idea that I, I'd like to popularize uh, is, is the notion of I-star. 
you, you know how economists talk about RSR and right. the natural rate of interest, the level of interest rate. And I find that to be the most annoying debate because there's no way to settle this, right? This is kind of like the Holy Ghost during mass. You know, no one sees it, but we all have to believe that it's there. Uh, and then, you know, everybody can say, oh, I think, I think R star is that number. Prove me wrong, you know. Uh, but you know, if you want to, if you want a job at the Fed, uh, you know, writing a paper on R star is probably a good way to go at it. Um, I, I don't want a job at the Fed. I want to understand what goes on in the market, and and I think there is this this I star, the optim, the natural level of inflation. Okay. Um, I think of it as as my weight. Um, you know, if, if 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 I go on a diet and I go too hard, like there's a level at which I, you know, my body wants to go back to. It's kind right. of the same thing with inflation, right? Okay. In, in 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 the 2000s, 2010s, I star was probably below two percent because every central banker on earth, except in emerging markets, uh, was fighting to get inflation to two yeah. percent, uh, and it was it was resisting, especially yeah. in Europe and Japan, right? And that was because of of the three forces I was describing: cheap goods from East Asia, excess savings from East Asia, Japan, and Europe, and and migrant labor from Mexico. Yeah. Um, I feel that now this I star has risen. Uh, yeah, but along with my weight, I was going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we all we all took a few pounds during that's COVID, right so. during the COVID. It was the I star rose for uh, and along with our weight. So the real question is, did I-Star rise because of the weight or was the weight coincidental? <laughs> so why do you think that the I-Star has risen in the last few years? So so let's go back to the three forces I mentioned, right? Cheap goods, cheap labor, cheap cheap capital. Uh, cheap goods, um, the main driver for, for what China did in the early 90s was demography. Uh, they needed to create 20 million jobs a year. Um, because of that huge youth bulge, basically the kids who were born between the the end of the Cultural Revolution and one child policy. Uh, so think about like late seventies. Now these workers who used to be young in the nineties are, are approaching retirement now, and they did not have any children of their own, or if they had, it was only one. Uh, so you have a massive generation that is leaving the labor force in China and is replaced by a generation that's only half the size. Uh, so China would have the exact opposite problem. Uh, it will need to destroy 10 to 20 million jobs a year. So China will not need this undervalued exchange rate. It will not need this double-digit growth number. It will not need to be the manufacturing hub of the world. On the other hand, China will need to have a a strong currency and low inflation at home because it will have a kind of an aging population. And, you know, the biggest risk for aging population is, is inflation. So China will will move from being deflationary for the rest of the world to being inflationary. Uh, we will no longer have access to this seemingly endless pool of cheap, qualified labor from China. So that's the, that's the, uh, the, the goods argument. Uh, moving to the, the capital argument, we, we lived in you know what, what was a global savings glut. Uh, we had too many countries that, that wanted to save and not enough that wanted to consume or invest. And in large part, again, this was because of demography. Uh, Europe, Japan, and China were at the, the lowest dependency ratio you can get, meaning that your your larger generation, the boomers, are between the ages of 50 and 65, so they are getting peak earnings. Uh, their parents are dead, and they have very few children, and if they have, they've already got, gone from the house. So your ability to save is enormous. This is why we've seen these giant current account surpluses in Germany, in Switzerland, in Japan, uh, because there were you know too, too many people working and saving and too few people consuming. Now, of course, it's going to change, right? It's, it's like flipping a switch. As soon as you reach 60, 62, 64, depending where you are in Europe, uh, you retire. So you, instead of being a contributor, you became a net beneficiary from the pension system and you need to start selling assets instead of accumulating them. So uh, the European and East Asian savings are no longer going to be recycled in, in the US and to other and emerging markets. They are going to be spent domestically to finance the, the the pension and the healthcare expense of, of boomers. Uh, so no more cheap goods, no more cheap capital. And then the last one it was labor. Uh, if you look at the net migration flow between the US and Mexico, it actually turned negative uh, about seven years ago. Uh, and it got a lot worse with COVID. Um, a, a lot of uh, Mexican workers you know, were, were forced out. They were the first to be let go, especially if they were legal. Uh, they also had to take care of their families. Uh, and, and they haven't come back because of the political situation. Uh, also, because Mexico is aging very rapidly. Uh, in 10 years, Mexico is going to be older than the U.S. 
so you know there won't be 10 million workers to to, to be sent up north i mean if anything i i'm actually just a month ago i did a, a road show in mexico city and it's the opposite that's happening i mean la roma the kind of hipster neighborhood of mexico city it's filled with americans really <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's you know it's it's better like you know Los Angeles is basically emptying itself into Mexico City, uh, you know you get better weather, better better food, better service, lower rents, uh, it's the cooler vibe. Um, You're so- kidding! I had no idea. There's a, so, so first of all, the fact that there's a hipster ver- uh, part of Mexico City just makes me laugh. But it make, uh, makes complete sense. There's hipsters everywhere. So why shouldn't they be in Mexico City? Um, so is it young people? Like, is that what it is? Or is Yeah, it it's your, your kind of creative type, work from home. Uh, some of them are probably let go today. You know, they work as product manager for Twitter. You know, the ones who yeah. post the, uh, <laughs> the videos on TikTok, you know, where, where they, they show off that they are at the pool. And then they, they only show up at the office because of the the free avocado and the yoga <laughs> sessions, that, that type of people. And um, what, I, what I was going to ask about is, can we just go back to China just just briefly before we go on to why inflation is going to go higher? You, you mentioned that you thought that China would actually need a higher currency going forward. And, and, and the way you uh, frame that, I had never really thought about it that way. Does this change your outlook about how to invest in China and what the potential is there when it comes to uh, your investment stance? Yes. Um, so in general, I view a lot of the currency, debt, interest rate, monetary policy issue, I tend to view them through the prism of generation and as, as, as trade-offs between generation. And, and I think when it comes to currencies, if you are a young country, you want a high growth and a cheap currency. Right, right, because okay. you need to create jobs for your for your labor force, and, and you know, like young people, they you know, growth matters more. Right? They they're not going to take cruises in in Europe, or you know, they they, they need jobs. Conversely, as as a, as a society ages, um, you want a strong currency because you need to import uh, most of the stuff that you're going to consume because you're not going to be able to, to produce it domestically, and you also want stability because as you age, your your ability to adjust to shocks is is much less. Right, you, you basically become a rentier. Um, and, and yeah, as China ages, it's, it's kind of accomplishing this transition from needing a deeply undervalued currency to basically being, uh, needing stability. And, uh, the, the investment implication for me is one I outlined in a, a report we published three years ago. It was called China is for bonds and the U S is for stocks. Uh, yeah. that, that basically, you know, you can, you know, if you only had to choose one of your two kids, which would you choose? <laughs> right. Because right. I, and, and I think for the U.S. it would be the stock market, right? Because that you know, I mean, Donald Trump used to tweet every day as you know, every time the, the Dow Jones made a new high, he took it as a personal victory. I mean, the, the U.S. is fundamentally an equity culture, a bull market culture. Conversely, in China, I think that the thing, the child they would pick would be the bond market or the currency. What China wants and needs is the yuan to be accepted as a uh, reserve currency, and they need to to be able to settle their, their commodity imports in yuan rather than US dollar. And the way to do that is can only happen if the yuan is a good store of value and if foreigners trust that the value of the yuan is going to be preserved and that Chinese government bonds offer positive real rate of returns. And indeed, that's been the case. We've seen the Chinese be very willing to sacrifice the stock market in order to defend the currency and the bond market. And I would say the opposite is true in the US. Um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, um, we're not there yet, but I, I think the uh, you know Powell would certainly gladly sacrifice the, the stock market and possibly the current no, sorry the bond market and possibly the currency in order to save the bond market and stocks. Okay, so uh, you know I, I think that's a fascinating insight about China. It's, it's uh, in your line about uh, about an older cu- country needing uh, you know a stable currency and a younger one needing growth. I think is terrific. Um, let's go on now to why this has changed. So we've seen this increase in inflation. And it's gone from, you know, we used to be able to not hit 2%. And now the, in terms of we couldn't hit it from the bottom. And now it looks like we're going to have trouble hitting it from the top. Why do you think that this isn't as big a deal as most of Wall Street and the government and the central banks think? Well, I, you know, if you look at the um, historical origin of the 2% target, you're not going to find it in the Federal Reserve Act. You're not going to find it in the uh, Maastricht Treaty, the one who set up the ECB. Uh, you're not going to find it in the 
the documents for the Bank of England, um, it's nowhere. Where does it come from? It comes from a New Zealand guy on TV who was asked about it and uh, answered randomly. You know, late 80s, New Zealand had a problem with inflation. And yeah, journalists asked, I think it was an economist, like, what do you think is a good level of inflation? And he said, eh, 2%. <laughs> Why did you say 2%? Not too high, not too low. That's is about it. it. And and then did the Bank of New Zealand, the the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, take that as the as the guide? Well, they were the first to yeah. do it. Is that correct? they were the first? And and you know who was the second, by the way? I think it was us Canadians. Yes, right? Yes, <laughs> correct. And and then the and then it spread. You know, the amazing thing is that it did not reach the U.S. until 2012. Actually, Bernanke is the one who actually made that, you know, kind of the official target of the Fed until 2012. The 2% was, you know, kind of an unofficial target, but it wasn't there. So the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that it's relatively new and it's certainly very arbitrary. Um, if you look at the distribution of, of growth and inflation in the U.S., there is nothing magical about that 2%. I mean, it is indeed the mode of the distribution. Like on average, inflation over the past century has been around 2.4. Uh, so I guess that's where it comes from. But when it comes to growth, uh, all you can see is that yeah, growth is usually pretty bad when you have deflation. I mean, deflation is is obviously a, a symptom of an economy that's not doing well. Right. And also, growth is is starts to fall once you rise once you go above ten percent, right? Because there's a there's an instability element about inflation, right? If you have more than ten percent inflation, you gotta you know reprint the price tag on every <laughs> every week or so. You gotta you know you can't really make plans about the future so investment drops people start to hold commodities so it starts acting as an economic drag but between that you know i would say one and eight you're fine if anything growth was actually a bit higher when you have like five six percent inflation and, and this is the experience by the way that's very common with emerging markets emerging markets they have a, a high inflation target uh because they have very cheap prices right I mean, you, you look at the price of a haircut in india or a cab ride it's very low so it's kind of understood that as economies develop and grow, prices are going to catch up, and it's okay to have a, a, a faster target for a little bit that actually smooths growth. Right. Uh, so when you're, to, well, I'm sorry to interrupt there, Vince. I just want to ensure when you're talking about the growth, you're talking about the real growth, the growth after inflation, and and you're arguing that it, a five percent inflation actually has higher real growth than a two percent inflation. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean that that, that is. That is what you would do if you were to download the GDP data and the inflation data from the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and you, you'd do the average by inflation bracket, you would find that. Right. Okay. And and so th- your point being that we've got this 2% inflation, it's kind of just pulled out of the air, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that that's any better or worse for our economy, as long as it's not above, it's not too high, you think it's good. And in fact, I've heard you argue that over the long run, more nominal inflation is actually what we need. Why don't you tell us why that is? Yeah, so it, it kind of goes back um, to this generational argument. Um, the, the, to me, the overwhelming problem faced by, by Western societies is the concentration of wealth in the hands of, of the boomers, wealth and political power. And you know, the, we have this abnormally large generation um, that was born after the war, didn't have parents because a lot of the parents were dead during the war and they had very few kids. So they were able to control political processes and institutions. And, you know, they voted themselves some nice things, things that they liked, <laughs> like like social security. You know, well, okay. I mean, boomers are for social security, for, for Medicare, for, for them, just right. not for everybody else, right? Uh, like, uh, you know, yeah, free healthcare, free pensions. Uh, and... Um, you know, they were lucky. They grew up in a, at an age when, when um, inflation was high. As a result, interest rates were high and, and valuations were very, very low. So they were able to buy the houses for, for their cheap. They were able to buy stocks for their cheap. And then they rode a fantastic bull market. And now the, the assets are stuck with them. Um, and these assets will need to be passed down to the Gen Z and, and millennials in the next 10 years. But the problem is the price is not right. The market is not clearing. You know, the boomer wants $2 million for his house and, you know, his son or grandson is, you know, making, you know, 50 grand and has student debt uh, and, and cannot afford the house. I mean, this is why, you know, Italian guys stay at their, their mama's house until they're 45. I mean, it's not because they like the pasta. 
it's because they cannot afford the, the apartment in Milan. So uh, are, you, are you just trying to uh, just to insult every every uh, country you can? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't gotten to Canada yet. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You're gonna be calling us maple syrup chugging uh, hosers before you know it. Okay. Um, so the problem is that the the boomers have too much of the assets, and how does inflation fix this? Right. So one chart that I like is to look at the uh, the ratio of the S and P 500 divided by the the minimum wage, um, and what what it tells you is is how how many hours you must you must work in order to buy one share in the S and P five hundred over time. When when boomers were coming of age in in the late seventies, that was that was about uh, four days. You know, we had the great inflation, we had very high interest rates, so wages had been boosted by inflation. I mean, that's what inflation does, right? It's it's you know, wages go up, and conversely, equity valuation had been compressed because we had you know eighteen percent Fed funds rate uh, and then single digit multiple on stocks, so they were able to buy stocks very cheap. Um, after four years of disinflation, uh, you end up with uh, four months. <laughs> so we go from four days to four months uh, of work to buy one share in the S&P 500. And that, that to me, kind of captures the experience and, and the angst and the anger of the millennial Gen Z generation. It's like, no matter what I do, I cannot get ahead in life. Okay. I cannot buy that house, you know, and I, I, I cannot, you know, pay off my, my, my student debt. And it's not just them, you know, being lazy, entitled, uh, kids, it, it, it is true. Uh, access to a middle class lifestyle was a lot easier in the 70s and the 80s, and it's a lot harder now because the prices of assets have taken off compared to the to wages. Okay. Um, and, and the result of that is this kind of, of inequalities that we're seeing across the world. There's both income and wealth inequality, but also generational. And another another point I will make, it's, it kind of ties in with the uh, the Thomas Piketty book capital in 21st century that you know french economist uh, wrote a lot about inequalities and he makes that very simple observation but um uh, very profound you know in in, in dividend discount models discount cash flow models that the, the denominator is r minus g the rate of return on capital minus the growth in the economy and that that number is assumed to be positive well if, if we keep the reasoning with that that means that over time capital compounds at a faster rate than wages and that means that over time, wealth concentrates at the top, which is indeed what we've seen uh, for the past 40 years. And if you keep doing it, you know, you'll end up with one guy, who, you know, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk will own the world and, and, and no one else will own anything else. So there needs to be some sort of a force that breaks this tendency, uh, like a deus ex machina that comes in to, to reset. Uh, um, you know, if, if you read the Bible, the in the Deuteronom, there is this the notion of the debt jubilee. Every fifty years, there shall be a jubilee throughout the land, and all the debts shall be cancelled. And by the way, the the, uh, um, the Bible is not the only religious text to refer to that. The Japanese culture would, would cancel the debt, I think, every forty years as well. Also, uh, Babylon would do the same thing. Okay. So it seems to be a a fundamental pattern that every fifty years or so you need to write down the value of debt to kind of reset society and reset these, these generational imbalances. And, and to me, you know, the last time inflation does that, and the last time we had this kind of inflationary debt jubilee was in, in the 70s. It's about 50 years now. All right. So why I, explain how that, uh, let's just kind of confirm what, what I think most people will know, but just confirm uh, how does that reset the debt if we have kind of a decade of 5% inflation? Right. So there are a couple of mechanisms. Uh, one is, yeah, unexpected inflation is effectively a, a default on uh, on the rent here, right? That's, that was Keynes' argument, euthanasia of the rent here, right? Right. Uh, instead of, of uh, legally defaulting, which is painful and, and creates political trouble, you, you just you just inflate the economy. And, you know, the you know when you bond mature, you're, you, you know, you're, you still get a thousand dollars, but you know it's worth two hundred dollars. Right. Uh, so effectively, you wiped out you know eighty percent. This is what the U.S. did after World War II. This is typically how you know highly indebted countries who do not have revolution deal with the debt. Is is with financial repression and and, and keeping uh, nominal rates below inflation. Uh, so you can do that either with with explicit uh, yield curve control, which is what Japan is doing, or you can do it just by letting inflation run hot. Um, keep surprising to the upside, which is what I think is going to happen in the U.S. Uh, so there's a 
that that's one mechanism and then the second mechanism let, let me go back to the the chart i was talking about the ratio of the s&p 500 to the minimum wage um what inflation does is that inflates the numerator right your minimum wage goes up i mean over time when you have high inflation wages you know wages go up and, and that's a good thing by the way i think you know the central bankers should be encouraging that, not fighting right. it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, yeah. more money for work, the working man is, is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and then, so the numerator goes up, and then your 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 denominator goes up, and then your numerator, which is the value of financial assets, goes down because your financial assets derive their value from expected cash flow in the future. Um, how do you uh, bring them to the present? You use a discount rate. Uh, when you have high inflation, you have a higher discount rate. So uh, the, the, the the value of these financial assets is, is much less. I mean, this is what we're seeing with uh, a lot of the, the tech stocks and the, uh, the the crypto, all that stuff. Like these very long duration assets get hammered once you have high inflation because high inflation means uh, higher discount rates. Right. So both the, the numerator drops, the denominator increases. So that ratio really fixes itself. So that's why I think you don't need all that much. Maybe seven, eight years of, of seven, eight percent inflation is is probably enough to reset a lot of these imbalances. Yeah, and I've argued this for a while. I said that all these people that are kind of hyperinflation uh, doomsayers, doomsayers, I say that that's not what we're going to have. We're going to have just a decade of 5% and, you know, it might be two, three at some point and then the other eight. So we're going to go back and forth. And then we're going to wake up a decade later and hopefully the debt will have been decreased by half. And, and we'll be in a better place. That, yeah. That's what, you know, that, that, that that's the thing that I'd like people to understand. It's, yes, it's painful now, but what is your alternative? I mean, your alternative is we, we reach a paradoxical uh, non sequitur in, in Europe with, you know, every government bond at negative yield, birth rates plummeting, no economic growth. I mean, this was a bad end. I mean, it, and then, you know, we just, we're just putting bubbles on tops of bubbles. Oh, we have too much debt. We need to lower the interest rate so that people can turn out more debt. And then I, that was, you know, when we had like 20 trillion of, of government debt and negative yield, that was the the universe telling, okay, you got to stop and try something else here. And, and that something else would be indeed higher inflation, lower real wages, uh, uh, higher, higher wages, lower asset prices. And what will happen then? Well, you'll see the millennial and Gen Z, they'll, they'll buy homes. They'll make babies. Household right. formation will pick up and we'll have actual real economic growth rather than this kind of succession of bubbles that we've been building on since, since the late 90s. Okay. So you and I are probably on the same page there that that's, that's not only is it the likely outcome, but it's probably the best outcome versus uh, just continual negative rates or actually defaulting on the debt. Because let's face it, there's too much debt to pay back in real terms. It's not going to happen. So something's got to give and... Uh, either that or, as you say, we'll have bread lines. It'll be 1930s all over. It'll be something like that. So out of all the options, I'm going to take that as well. But, but, and this is a big but, and this is where I really want to, I'm interested in getting into it with you. You are assuming that the Gen Z slash millennial, or, or is that the same thing? Wh whatever, those generations will win the argument. And right now I would kind of say that when you look at Powell and you look at his response to inflation, it's 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 anything but that. It looks to me like the the baby boomers that don't want the inflation. Uh, they were surprised by the amount of inflation they got, and their response is immediately to have the tightest monetary response that we've ever had. We're gonna it, this year. We'll have more tightening. If, if he tightens next meeting, more tightening than any year, even with the Volcker years and not, I'm not talking about percentage, I'm not talking about absolute basis point terms. So I, what I worry about with your analysis is that you're assuming that the, the baby boomers allow this to happen. And I'm not sure you're correct. Well, let me, let me flip that question on you there. And um, let me make a hypothetical. Let's assume that Jay Powell sees the world the same way we do. Would he say it in a press conference? Oh, I, I agree with you there that he's never going to say it out loud. They're never going to come out and say, no, we're going we're gonna to allow financial repression to happen. I'm with you. But having said that, when we go look at it, he has tightened more than any other, you know, Fed chair so far. And even when you see him at the, the latest, you know, press conference, He's continually to be hawkish, and whether he is or not is really the question that everyone needs to be asking themselves. And your argument is 
he's going to talk hawkish, but be yes. dovish. Is that correct? Correct. I mean, eventually, yes. And I think really what he wants, and I would do the same thing if I were, you know, I would talk a really tough game because what I want to do is I want to anchor this inflation expectation. I want to avoid the scenario where it goes, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then Venezuela, uh, which I don't think is a real risk in the U.S. But you know, the uh, inflation is a psychological mechanism. It's you know, like like most things in the universe, it's a creation of the mind, uh, and uh, you really uh, want to be very careful that it, you know inflation inflation does not feed on itself and and the way you do that is by talking a really tough game you know saying i don't know how many times he said he's going to be paul volker uh but you want to hammer that perception that the plan will only work if people be, do not believe in it right the moment <laughs> you know the moment everybody starts thinking like you or me yeah. uh, we have a problem right because we all you know gonna hoard resources or empty our checking account or uh you know buy buy brazilian stocks or whatever uh and it won't work so um i think for now the situation is just perfect uh you know we have eight percent inflation falling down not very quickly I, I don't think it falls below five by the way but you know for it will uh, so, you know, it looks like it's working. It looks like they're doing their job. Inflation expectations are anchored. And in the meantime, uh, yeah, uh, here's an here's a interesting question for you. Uh, what do you think in, is the growth in tax collection for the, the IRS this year? I think it's through the moon. Like, I think the economy is way stronger than, yeah. than we understand. That is correct. It's, it's up by 15%. And last year, it was up by 38%. Yeah. Total tax collection. Uh, and that is the magic of inflation. Inflation inflates everything, especially tax receipts. Because tax receipts, you know, there's bracket creep, right? I mean, as 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 every price gets gets written higher, you, you fall in higher brackets. So there's more than a one to one relation between the pace of inflation and the growth in government revenue. Uh, so it is it is a windfall. Uh, it's a blessing. Uh, you know, it's very hard to get, you know, we, we have very broken government in the U.S. and most likely we'll have gridlock after November. Uh, you cannot pass any sort of reform. You cannot, you know, pass any tax increase. You, you cannot default on the debt. So what's your best option? Best option is to let inflation run high and, and, and take care of the problem for you. And that, that's what's happening right now. OK, so for me, um, Vincent, my mistake that I made this year was that I thought we were going to have inflation. Uh, and I correctly thought that. And I also thought that we would have a Federal Reserve that accepted that as part of, right. the, of the financial repression. Right. I'm with you. I buy your argument completely. What I worry about now is the fact that we're unsure about how much of the inflation was supply side and how much of it was demand side. We could probably agree that there, there it, it's... A, a bit of both like there's like it's not it's ne it's not one or the other and that it is a combination of the two and what really concerns me is that what if it was a lot of the supply side and we've now had let's say this eight percent inflation and and let's just imagine without um without the without the Ukraine war, without the second China lockdown, right. that we would have had inflation, but let's say it would have gone and your I stars is, is actually, instead of it being five or whatever it is, let's say it's four and a half or something. Right. It's really, it's gone from two or one and a half to three. Right. And what we've now got is a, is a, is a federal reserve that is in essence panicking. And that's what it feels like to me. Right panicking on the upside and I, I i worry that although you could be correct with your analysis and i think you will be over time that the next shoe to drop is actually him going way too far the other way on the upside right um that's a good point um a couple of thoughts i'm not sure the answer your your, your question but uh at least there will be bits to to feed the conversation um, one is, um, on where I star might be, uh, I like to look at, um, inflation in stuff that could not be produced in China or, you know, uh, could not use, uh, a lot of, 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 Mexican labor. Uh, and to me that would be healthcare. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, and you look, you look at the healthcare CPI in the U.S. been running at four or five percent a year for the past um, you know forty years. Uh, so that that is where I think the natural level of inflation would be. Oh, um, that's an interesting way of putting it. So your argument is that you can't replace it with goods from overseas or or labor. There's no yeah, labor of certification. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes. And so that is your. Uh, best kind of scenario or best estimate for where that natural I star is in the government. And so in the, in the U S and so how variable has that been? And, and is it creeping up? Um, well, I mean, if we just look at healthcare inflation, it's kind of complicated because, uh, you know, COVID has, has thrown a big wrench into it. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, at first it was actually, disinflationary right because because people didn't go to the doctor because they were afraid of catching covid so now that's that's one of the reasons why inflation is coming back with a vengeance is now healthcare is, is playing catch up if you look at your your core service pce uh it's driven a lot by healthcare services uh which you know we're running two percent below overall inflation and my, my guess is that it's going to go back to where it wants to be which is two percent higher than overall inflation and that's one of the reasons why i think inflation is going to be more persistent to that than the, the shelter cost that everybody talks about okay um so, uh, yeah, um, now your question was about Powell kind of overdoing it, panicking because, you know, basically he's trying to make up for the hikes he didn't make in, in, in 2021. Well, no, by- but not just that. He's overdoing it because some of it is at the, at the very least, some of it is supply side that will right. solve itself. Well, so w- w- I think I would say that's. It's a bit too early to tell, you know, whether okay. he's, you know, over overreacting or not. We, we, you know, that was the conversation about the lags, right? We don't know how we don't see the impact of the tightening right now, right? So we're kind of acting blind. So we, we, we'll see in a couple of months where where things fall here. Um, I, I think the cost of that mistake will will become uh, self defeating uh, at some point. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, we. You know, if we raise the Fed funds rate to ten percent, <laughs> we'll kill inflation. I mean, but we'll kill the labor market with it. <laughs> we'll and we'll kill the world economy. Right? Do you, you know, actually? We'll, we'll, we'll do send you, the dog. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, go I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I mean, I, I just wanted to ask you about that part though, because I'm not so sure that they're going to kill the 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 econ- the world economy as they raise rates. I think eventually, the rest of the economy, the rest of the world, just starts to to push back. And I think we've already seen right. this where central banks are not right. following the Fed higher and they're just saying, no, that's fine. And yes, the people that have borrowed in U.S. dollars, it's a problem. But for everyone else, like what's stopping them from saying, let's start trading our oil in Canadian dollars. Let's start trading this in renminbi and, and, and just not relying on the U.S. as the provider of liquidity for, glo- for global trade. Yeah, that's a very interesting observation. Uh, well, I think that that comes with a cost to the U.S., right? I mean, the U.S. is not an island. The U.S. cannot uh, ignore uh, the pressure from, from the rest of the world. I mean, if the, the dollar index ex- hits 200, it, it's really going to break things. And it, it could even break the dollar itself, as, as you mentioned. Right. Uh, so I, I think a lot of that is going to be clearer, come clearer early next year. I, I think there is a... Uh, there's a window of opportunity to to kind of avoid that scenario. Let, let's call that the Brent Johnson scenario, right? Where the, the dollar milkshake, the, the dollar sucks up all the liquidity in the world and kind of, you know, but I think he would. But I think where I would differ from him is I'm not sure that it sucks up all the liquidity and then the world doesn't the, the world doesn't adapt. And I and I'm not sure that as the dollar goes higher that we don't see other countries pushing back and ultimately their economies end up being stronger because they're not pushing real rates into, you know, high levels. Yeah. My view is that we're not going to get there. And I think because of that, that window of opportunity that will be around March, March, April next year. So, you know, I I've joined the peak inflation camp like, for the first time, okay, I, I do believe yeah, nine point one was the peak for, for for this cycle at least, okay. unless we have an accident with 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 oil prices, which is always a risk. But let's say we don't have an accident with oil prices, you know, the the, the economy is inflating. Uh, my my base basic sense is we, we end up the year at you know seven point five on CPI, uh, six point five on core, and then by the time we reach March, 
you know, it's the one year anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine. So that sent your base effect were usually positive after that, right? Every commodity was up like 30, 40%, 40%. That's going to roll off in March, April. So okay. you'll see like an air pocket in the CPI. So that would take us from, let's say, seven to about five. Now, this is the moment also, if you look at the, um, the, the, the OIS curve, uh, after yesterday's meeting, now it's gone about five, right? The terminal rate is priced to be 5.2. So there will be a very brief moment where technically you could say the job is done. The Fed funds rate is above the level of the CPI. Now, if I'm Powell, and I believe Powell is a smart man, and he probably views the world the same way we do, this is your, your get, out of car, get out of jail card free. Uh, this is the moment where, where you can do what, what George W. Did, did, Bush did in Iraq in 2003. You know, there was no WMD. The war was going horribly. What do we do? We have a big aircraft carrier and a big sign, mission accomplished, and we never talk about it again. <laughs> I think you, if I you, were in the Fed. You yeah. think that Powell can do that? Of course. You know, mission accomplished. Look, inflation so, so, has fallen from 9% to 5 The Fed funds rate is at 5 I've been the, the hero. I've been the, uh, the Paul Volcker and... You know, and by then something else would have happened. You know, we, we're very short attention span creatures. I mean, I don't know what it will be, if it will be another war or some big hedge fund blowing up or some big financial institution running into some liquidity problem. There will be there will be some other fire to put out and Powell will be, well, I would have loved to keep going, but, you know, I, my duty called for this. And you know what, inflation now, yeah, maybe it's not 2%, but, you know, you know, 4 5 I mean, Let's leave it like that for a little bit. A few so, I, I completely get what you're saying that that we will have real rates being positive, not just on forward implied real rates, but actual rates above the rate of inflation will be positive. And your argument is that they'll use that as the chance to say, "Look, we've done what we can, and now it's uh, the market has to to do the rest." Yeah, and and listen that that. They're doing better than the Bank of England. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all relative, yeah. right? I mean, the, the U.S. has, you know, the a greater ability than any other country to 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 raise rates, at least in the in the developed world. So, you know, it, it it's good enough. Like you're, you're first. I mean, so I would agree with you that that's what the Federal Reserve or the FOMC committee would like to do, and I do believe that it's what a lot of governments and stuff would do. I'm not as convinced. That that's what Powell will do, and maybe it's because he's burned me so much, <laughs> Vincent, that I'm like he's actually convinced me. But I, I, I go back to all these stories about him being Arthur Burns, and I, I just wonder if it ends up being that we're going to see more uh, conflict between him and the government, and we are going to get into a situation where. It's like uh, when the farmers drove trucks up in front of the Federal Reserve and, and people were mailing in the keys to their house, foreclosed houses to Paul Volcker. If, it, if it's going to get more contentious, then we might guess. I mean, time will tell, but my, my overall impression is that institutions and incentives matter more than people and that you don't rise to position of significant power without a lot of flexibility and a lot of capacity to adjust. To ah, that's a good point. Okay, that's a good point. I buy that. Because at the end of the day, your argument is Powell's a, a political creature and he will adjust as we get there. So although he's saying this now, once we get there and the tides turn, he will tr- turn with the tide. Yes. Ah, that's good. Okay, I can buy that. I can buy that. Okay, so then let's think about, let's assume you're correct and that we are close to peak uh uh, hawkish Powell. Okay. How does, how do financial markets take that as they figure this out? Cause they will figure it out. Even right. though he will sit there and talk all hawkish. Right. We will see the markets figure out. And I might even argue that we've already seen this. Yeah. We could the U S yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're, we're taping this on Friday and, uh, the, the U S dollar just had the biggest yeah. decline since 2020 yeah. or something. And yet this is just after Powell, you know, gave the, his most hawkish uh, uh, performance ever. And yet here we go, stock market rallying, uh, dollar selling off. So I, I'd, I'd love to hear, uh, A, whether you think the market figures it out and B, how, that, how the market reacts to that. Well, I think this will be the, the moments you and I have been waiting for. <laughs> what, four years with like steepener trades? Is that, is that it? <laughs> 
<laughs> so you think this, the long end will will yes. that'll scare the long end? People will go back to old market and be like, Kevin, we called it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was eight only... years before the fact. <laughs> It doesn't count as calling it if you're always long it. Um, <laughs> so is is that is that what you're watching for? So, yeah, for, I think I think they are weaker dollar rally in in commodities, gold, which we saw today, uh, and and then uh, you know long end starts to steepen because you start to price in you know four five percent inflation for a long time, higher term premium, uh, and and also maybe uh, you know. Um, you know, our performance by banks, right? Because you, you see these steeper curves, you realize that the economy, we're not going to break the economy. We're actually going to allow to run it hard for a bit. Uh, so I think that unleashes a uh, kind of um, similar market environment as uh, I would guess 2003 to 2007, uh, global reflation, weak dollar, uh, steepening curves and, and our performance by banks and energy. Okay. So I know you have what you call the Holy Trinity to set up to take advantage of that. We're going to talk about that. But before we do, you mentioned the term premium. And one of the things that scares me is that I've been perplexed at the fact that the term premium has stayed, not only has it not expanded to the positive, and, and you'd think if you'd said to me, we just had 9% inflation, what's term premium doing? I would have told you it was exploding higher. It's actually gone more negative. And I was wondering if you have any insights in that and whether you worry that we might have, we might still have a Bank of England type uh, accident at the long end of the bond market. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's hard for me to answer because I share your, your confusion, uh, both from a kind of philosophical and, and practical uh, reasons. The philosophical side, yeah, it's, What's your term premium here for? It's, it's to compensate for the fact that future is unknown and money, the path of monetary policy is uncertain. Right. And it kind of makes sense to me that it would have fallen for the past 30 years because inflation was falling, growth was slow but steady, and we had forward guidance, right? We had right. several bankers telling us, well, it's going to stay there forever. So yeah. you don't need the term premium there. Yeah. Uh, to me, this this environment is, has gone right. We have a very volatile inflation, not just higher, but that's another thing with inflation: is the higher it is, the more volatile it becomes, right? You see that, for example, in used cars, right? It's going to be up thirty percent one month, down thirty the next, right? So, higher economic volatility, uh, higher inflation, uh, that that should lead force lead investors to demand a higher term premium. It's riskier to be in the long end now than it was four years ago right uh, and you're not getting compensated for it adequately in my opinion so that's kind of the uh the philosophical case and then the practical case is uh yeah we we are say we are seeing uh you know disaccumulation of reserves by foreign central banks so that should be you know selling um but maybe that's more on the short end actually it's part yeah of well because yeah, yeah. they don't usually own past five i think they're like twos yeah and five so, so right? may, like, may, maybe maybe that's why we see, maybe because we've had this kind of strong dollar uh and then, then that leads to selling by foreign central banks maybe that puts the pressure on the short end rather than the long end but i would say on the long end you're going to see it coming from the boomers right because uh, i mean the, Typically, in your asset allocation, as you, as you age, right, you go from stocks into bonds. So initially, you you know that 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 lowest bond yield as boomers age. But then, as as you get into retirement, you know, you start shortening the duration of your assets. So you, you're going to sell that 30 year bond and replace it with a, you know, two year tips or something like that. Uh, so I think as time passes, we'll, we'll be faced with a, a structural lack of buyer at the long end, especially as as the Fed steps out or, God forbid, actively sells security. <laughs> and that's never going to happen, Vincent. <laughs> I, I I would also um, I, I'm very confused about the term premium and uh, for all the reasons that you just mentioned. And I would also add that we're having more economic volatility and the fact that the Federal Reserve is being so uh, aggressive with their things. If you think about the supply response um, that that would uh, if, if you do have excess demand because we did all the fiscal and there's there's excess demand and not only that there's reshoring so we need to have expansion of uh, kind of economic output at home but if you think about what that takes that means you hire more people you expand your capex you make more factories yet if if you think about what powell is doing with his rhetoric and his raising rates he's not encouraging gov uh, companies to go and do that supply response because they're scared to death of what of all what he's saying and what he's doing 
So in essence, we're creating an environment that's even that that potentially could have more inflation on the other side after we finally we kill demand. Everything comes back in, and then next thing you know, when demand picks up again, there's no supply response because Powell has made the uh, the economy more less res- more. Let's just say hasn't allowed the economy to expand like it should. So we're creating way more economic volatility, which again should mean right. the term premium should be expanding. But one of the things that I I wonder is if we think back to 1982 and we think to the point when Volcker was there and he said he was going to kill inflation, he raised rates. And remember how high he had to raise rates in terms of real terms? He had to crank them. And even then there was like the Dr. Doom, Henry Kaufman talking about how it wasn't going to be high enough and there was no way they were going to kill it. And it took, what, like a decade before real rates finally came back down and we finally went into this you know true bull market i wonder if we're getting the opposite that people have had years and years and years of bonds always returning back to one percent two percent and just as you couldn't convince people to buy bonds in the 80s where we can't convince them to sell them now any any kind of comments thoughts no, that, that's a, that's a fantastic point. Uh, yeah, you, you remember these inflation scares, right? We we had all the way, um, even in the mid nineties. Well, it was that uh, James Carville? You know, he he said, uh, "Oh, if I could be anything, I'd be the bond market because I could scare <laughs> you know I could scare anybody." Like, what, what, can you think back about how insane that is? Right, this is the Clinton budget, nineteen ninety four, nineteen ninety five. You know, the U.S. economy is booming. There is no debt. We're gonna have a surplus. And the bond market is freaking out about like, yeah. like what the hell? Yeah. This is the yeah, you know the it's the the painting by Dali, right? The persistence of memory, right? We we, we live in the past and we we the, the ghosts of, of you know of past periods always lies with us. And in yeah, throughout the eighties, I mean it was very clear that the economy was inflating, but but still people were were very cautious when it came to, to long term bonds and and every time you had like a slightest uptick in inflation, you had these big, big sell offs. Right. Um and so, it could be the opposite it, now. But, but this is exactly what we by the way, this is I think this is the reason why Powell is being so hawkish and, and, and talks so tough is because the market doesn't get it. You know, if, if only people would be smart, you wouldn't need to do this, you know, but yeah. but, but he, he started the year. I want tighter financial condition. I'm going to raise the agent. Okay. I got the memo. I, you know, I sold my risk assets. I'm like, okay, you know, but, but people don't like, look at this summer. They were, they were buying stupid Bed Bath Beyond and, <laughs> and, and, and meme stock and crypto again. I mean, yeah, you got to club them on the head every month and then you got to, you know, the, the beating shall continue until more improves. All right. <laughs> All right. Now, so you have a portfolio or not a portfolio, uh, a theme in terms of how to take advantage of what we think should be higher rates, higher inflation in the forward. And it doesn't uh, entail buying more Bitcoin or Bed Bath & Beyond. So why don't you tell us about the Holy Trinity? Right. So this is a um, a model that we built for uh, some of our institutional clients, kind of Garpy type of money, growth and reasonable price, trying to rank sectors across fundamentals, valuation, and and, and risk. And uh, that model's been overweight energy for you know two years and a half, which has been a great call, obviously. The second was was uh, healthcare, and the one that started to pop up in uh, this year, twenty twenty two, was financial. So I'm like, okay, let, let me look how well that would have performed. And uh, if you did a third, a third, a third in energy, financials, and healthcare. You'd be up by seven percent for the year when the market is down by twenty to one, twenty-two percent, and that's a hundred percent equity portfolio, right? And not only you're up, but you're up with very minimal volatility, very small drawdown. And, and the question is to why? Why I think is because you are hedging against the three risks that we keep, you know, running into every month or so. We have a new panic, but it's always about the the, the same three things. It's either about inflation running too high, in which case energy is your best performing sector. Or it's about, oh, no, power is going to hike into a recession and yada, yada, which I don't believe. But in that case, healthcare is, is, is actually the most defensive sector, better than utilities. Uh, so healthcare is the best performing sector. Or it's about, oh, no, power is going to hike, yield curve is going to steepen, and your yield curve moves up. And in that case, financial is the only sector that's up. So at any correction, you have a third of your portfolio in the best performing sector. This is why you have such low volatility and such high returns so far this year. That's a fascinating thing. That's um, 
it could it, it's replacing the old um, stocks and bonds being negatively correlated, which I think is the uh, the most difficult thing facing investors right now is the fact that that relationship is gone. So you're making the new one. It's just you're having three asset classes. Yeah, and uh, but yeah, they're all equities only. I mean, well, I think not it, asset classes. Yeah, the, uh, sectors. Let's just call them. Yeah, in, in general, I I think the you know the special, that that diversification argument is especially tr- strong for for commodities and energy and to a lesser extent financials. Uh, you know, if you look at the the trading two year correlation between commodities, the, the Bloomberg Commodities Index and the sixty forty portfolio is now negative. Uh, so you know, we 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 came from a world where you know, you, you would diversify your your stocks with long term treasuries, right? Risk on, risk off. Uh, now your treasuries and your stock are positive correlated. You need to find a new risk off asset, and that's. I think there's a portfolio construction argument for commodities and energy equities, even if you don't believe in the whole, uh, you know, uh, new bull market for commodities and underinvestment thesis, which I kind of do. I believe in that, but purely <laughs> from a purely from a a, a portfolio construction argument. You know, we, we got to go back to the 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 way, the, like every pension fund is going to get consultants that are going to come and make presentation on commodities as an asset class, and you need to invest like seven percent of your portfolio in commodities, like like it used to be the case in two thousand four, two thousand eleven, uh, and that will create investment demand uh, for commodities. Um, and then the, on the secondary basis, I think that also to some extent applies to financial because of the high correlation with, with yields. Uh, you need a, an asset that is inversely correlated, in, correlated to bond prices, and that tends to be big banks. What, um, you mentioned the fact that you're going to get investment consultants coming to the pension plans and other endowments and, and recommending something. What do you, uh, you know, for those that have been in this game for a while, we understand that process very well and how long that uh, will look, occur. But why don't you just kind of explain to people how that works in, and in in kind of why that is why that is a big deal. Well, how that works is uh, typically you take uh, you know bright young kids from Ivy League universities and with an MBA, you give them um, shiny shoes and a good a good suit and a a uh, Markowitz optimization software and a beautiful PowerPoint, and and they go around and they tell you know somewhat uh, tired and underpaid uh, managers of, of, of pension funds, what they should have done in the past 10 years. And it's so obvious. <laughs> <laughs> and they and they do it. And, and from my understanding, uh, I've spoken to um, people that are, are familiar with this. It ends up being a theme that they, they push. They push it for a long time. And not only that, when it starts – it lasts forever. Yeah. So, so the last one was like private equity and VC, right? Oh, right. you need to capture that illiquidity premium. And I mean, it, we all know how ridiculous a lot of that is. You know, you just mark your assets once a quarter so the volatility disappears and you can make up your own valuation. Like, like I think, it, what, was it Calpers or Harvard that, that you know, that apparently like their private equity portfolio is up for the year or something? Uh, I know. I can't believe it. I speak to buddies that, are, that have some private credit and things and they're telling me that their stuff is up and I'm like, every financial asset in the world is down almost like how the hell are you guys up and not only that the discount rate upon which you discount everything has just exploded higher like it makes no sense yeah but that that's to your point right the, the, the inertia of uh, i mean we're talking about you know the, the very slow moving institutions with very long time horizon with you know investment committees that you know take a long time so uh, right now, I would think, yeah, that we're still kind of living off the tail end of this kind of rush to get uh, pension fund endowment money into private credit, venture capital, and and as the the ghost emerges and then the assets get repriced, you know, they'll realize in horror that you know actually uh, a a private investment in an unlisted startup that loses money is even riskier than you know buying the Nasdaq. Uh, so they move to the next thing, which, in my opinion, could be commodities, could be Brazilian stocks, uh, could be energy equities, uh, and and then the the consultants will you know update the PowerPoint and change a few slides and and give the exact opposite pitch. Right. And, and what, just so you know, one of my, the, the buddies that I talked to, a very shrewd operator that's way smarter than me, he's convinced that what we're going to get is the move from growth stocks into value stocks. And that will be something that the pension consultants will be pushing for 
uh, for a long time. Um, Vincent, when you think about uh, what kind of scares you, like what worries you about what could go wrong with your forecast, I'd love to kind of uh, pick your brain about what you're watching for in terms of things going wrong and, and what would be the signals that it isn't going the way you thought. Yeah, to me, the the most kind of probable high, I mean, you have a bunch of high intensity risks that, you know, I don't have any insight on, right? We could have a nuclear war tomorrow. We could yeah. have, you know, China invade Taiwan, but, um, you know, I, I'm, my guess is as good as any is here. Yeah. Uh, in terms of high probability, maybe not not more than 50% chance, but certainly more than 10, is that another energy shock to me would be kind of the, the nightmare scenario for that the scenario I was outlining before where inflation comes down, not as quickly as the market expects, but still, you know, quick enough to allow the Fed to declare victory and to stop these crazy hikes. Uh, if we do see, and I mean, today was kind of scary, right? I mean, we're looking at, you know, 90 plus now on, on oil prices. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we could be at 100 very soon. Uh, we have uh, coming sanctions on, on Russia from the EU and Japan that kick off, I think, December 5. And then, the, you know, the... the the billion dollar question is 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 China reopening, and and I actually hear this is from my friend Louis Vincent Gav, the the other yeah. and uh, more famous <laughs> and better looking French macro guy, uh, a great friend, fantastic guy, and you know he I I think he he really nails it by by saying you know what what comes from first the the the, the dovish the Fed people or the Xi Jinping people will will she give up on zero COVID and reopen the Chinese economy before we have enough disinflation in the U.S. to allow the Fed to pivot. Okay. Uh, and if that's the case, if I think everybody's working assumption is that, you know, zero COVID is going to, you know, stay in China until until the spring. But if, if, if the Chinese economy reopens uh, and, and God forbid there's a bit of stimulus to, to get things going, uh, then you could see, you know, commodity prices like, like what we saw with copper today, uh, just just going through the roof, and then that means you never get to disinflation in the U.S., so you can never really ease, uh, and then and then we start breaking things. And and I think there's a good chance of that happening in the winter. It's not my base case scenario, but it's certainly you know I don't know thirty forty percent chance in my mind. Okay, so let's just walk through how that would work. So China reopens, we get uh, the commodities start screaming, we get oil. I, I'm assuming is the one that really matters. Let's just say oil comes in by Christmas time. Oil is what one hundred twenty-five dollars. So that's just been a, a big, a big up push up. Uh, I'm assuming that given this, more than likely Powell's gone seventy-five um, again because he's got to, you know, do it. But what what breaks? Like what? How does that play out? And where does the break come from? And just kind of walk me through what you think happens. Is it the dollar because people are rushing into dollars because he's raising rates? Like how do how do you see a breaking of that occurs? I mean, I, it's a very hard one because it's a very murky, highly volatile scenario where you could almost you can construct it as either dollar bearish or dollar bull, bullish. Yeah. Uh, you. Um, but your well, argument think- is it's just that the economic volatility of prices moving that fast will eventually be negative for the market. Right. Is that, is I that- mean, I, I, I don't know what breaks, but I know where I want to be, that where, where to happen. I want to be, you know, short duration, uh, inflation sensitive, uh, commodities exposure, precious metal, uh, value stocks, uh, and also keep cash because I think you'd see a lot of market dislocation uh, in that scenario. Okay. All right. And so now that was one worry that you had. Where else do you think you could go wrong? What about on the other side? Like one one of the things I was thinking about the other day is that everyone thinks that inflation is going to stay high. What if it ends up being that it surprises to the downside? Yeah, that's uh, that's a hard one for me to to envision because because uh, <laughs> you're such an inflation yeah, ball. <laughs> I, I, I spent yeah five years writing against that thesis. It's surprisingly it's. Strong thesis. Like if you look at the math, like yeah, you you look okay. You make some not so crazy assumption about used cars and and then the energy prices and the uh, hotels and yeah, they're, they're, they're. I think it's very narrow, but it's it's not a zero percent chance. I kind of agree with that. Well, then I mean the the answer would you know double down on the, on the crazy stuff, right? I mean go back to the the things that were going parabolic in, in twenty twenty one and all the uh, you, you know. Th- uh, do you no- really think? Because I'm not sure you're right. I think that they come. I, I I'm not sure that they don't come for the gold and the commodities. 
Like you think they're going to go back to buying? Uh, well, there certainly is that impulse. I mean, you look at the 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 flows so far. I mean, even though the you know the there hasn't been people haven't sold uh, their their hyper growth stocks uh, yet. So I, I think that you know that the narrative is still it's not dead yet. I mean, that's why Powell needs to collaborate every month. Uh, uh, okay. It's, yeah. Okay. Fair uh, enough. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If 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 it was dead, then he wouldn't have to do this, and we wouldn't have this. The like, what was it in the summer when he was gonna at Jackson Hole? He was gonna talk about something. He was gonna. He had a speech written, and then he saw what everyone was doing, and he had to threw it all away and hammered us on the head. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one, uh, Vincent. One of the things I'd love to hear is you go around. You talk to a lot of smart investors. Why don't you tell us what you're seeing in terms of how they're set up? Um, so my, uh, I think I, I suffer from confirmation bias because, I mean, I'm just back from a, a road show in, in Brazil where, where, by the way, you are an absolute star. Uh, <laughs> I mean, at pretty much every single one of my meeting, your name came up. Oh, uh, it's, it's just because I'd say that the Brazilians and the Irish are the nicest people in the world, which they very much are. The two of them are the most, the nicest, wonderful, most wonderful people. Well, I'd say that about the Canadians as well. But, uh. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. Um, so you're there, and 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 now, well, actually, while we're talking about Brazil, one of the things that shocks me, and they are wonderful people, but not only that, extremely knowledgeable about yes. macro events. Yes. And I will even say this: I think that the Brazilian folks understood this cycle better than almost anyone because and they've seen inflation they, before. Exactly. So that that's where the confirmation bias comes for me. Is I, I do most of my travel in, in Latin America, and these are these are places when when you see a central banker who's let inflation go to nine percent, and then look at your debt series, and I'm gonna keep doing it until the job is done. They laugh because <laughs> they know what it means. Uh, if you if you're debt serious about inflation, you don't let it go to nine point one percent. So, so yeah, and you know, there's a big kind of global macro trading culture in, in Brazil. A lot, of, a lot of hedge funds are, you know, trading inflation with, with very sophisticated strategies. And then they've been very successful this year. I mean, some of the most well-known Brazilian hedge funds are up 70, 80% for the year. Oh, yeah, that's uh, awesome. Because, because of, of right currency trade and, and, and right, right um, being on the right side of inflation, most likely because they listen to our interviews on the market hurdle. <laughs> so do you worry at all that everyone is already long too much inflation? Does that concern you? I mean, in my client base, yes, but I, I really don't think it's representative of uh, of the world. I think the world is still, I mean, I, I'm kind like, of a believer in the inertia uh, argument you were making earlier. Like in the 80s, people worried about the inflation of the 70s. I think in the 2020s, people will still want to naturally go back to like the 60 40 portfolio the risk parity stuff oh inflation you know and also anybody who has a quant model right i mean this is this is kind of one of the, the discussion i have a lot with some of my, my former colleagues from from the davis research uh and who have a, a quant um and i have it too like a kind of a a, a quant background you know you, your model wants to mean revert Right. Uh, so it's based upon the last 20 years. It's not using 1970s and 60s data. Yes. So anybody who has some sort of a quant driven investment has a built in bias for deflation, for negative correlation between stocks and bonds, for low yields, high valuation, and stuff like that. So to me, the, yeah, the big, I, I think that it was that transition uh, away from deflation play to inflation plays is going to. It's going to take a decade. Okay. So what we're watching for is not when the inflation and the smart Brazilian macro traders are asking for Vincent Delawal to come by and speak to them. It's when CalPERS and the other behemoths want to know about inflation and want that. That's when we should be selling. And until then, we're going to stay long. <laughs> yes. Okay. So listen, you know, we're going to ask you uh, for a Byron Ween surprise. Byron Ween loved to used to create, um, or maybe he still does actually, uh, what he calls his surprises for the year and how he defines a surprise is something that he thinks has, uh, the market believes has a less than a third chance of, uh, of occurring over the next year, but he thinks there's more than a 50 50 chance of that happening. Do you have a Byron Ween surprise for us? Um, 
I'm probably going to look like a fool with that. And like, like the idiots I was making fun of earlier. This no, call, but, but the yeah. last, your last d- Byron Wien surprise was inflation and you nailed d- it. All right. A double digit in gold price, uh, a double digit increase uh, in, in gold prices for next year. Double digit meaning more than 10%? Yes. Okay. I, I'm uh, Listen, I think that that's easy. I'm on the record, Vincent, for saying that I think we're going to have a thousand dollar up week in gold. And I still, I'm not, I'm not pulling back on that. I think it's going to occur. <laughs> I think if there's going to be a nickel type situation one day in, uh, in gold or silver or something, yes. I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility. And no, I am not one of those guys who doesn't believe there's gold in Fort Knox and stuff. But I do think that the amount of financial trading that occurs could have it happen. They're not that big a market. Uh, also, uh, s- 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 if I can do a secondary guess. Oh, of course. Uh, okay. Uh, France gets kicked out of the World Cup at the group stage. Really? <laughs> wow. Why is that? They don't have a good team? No, we, the, the opposite. We have a great team. That's when we usually lose. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now, you know that uh, Canada's in our first, we're in our first one ever. Okay, so I'll, I'll oh. double that up and I'll say Canada is going to fare better <laughs> than France in the next World Cup. <laughs> Wouldn't it be something if we ended up being the ones that kicked you out? Although I don't know if we're in your group or whatever it is. So you think like those the groups of four, it does, they, France doesn't even make it out of their group? Yeah. Oh, who are the other three? Do you know? Uh, we don't have a really hard group. Um... You just think that they're that big of chokers. Yeah, like again, the, the easier the easier it is for the the, the worse we do. So um, that's that was my my guess. All right, okay. Um, so Vincent, uh, we got to talk about the elephant in the room. <laughs> when you were uh, when you were on last time, you made a startling confession that made us all. Oh, you know what? It actually was it was very nice to see because it allowed many manly men to embrace their more feminine side and admit to the shows they watch. And you agree, admitted that you loved Emily in Paris. And uh, Vincent, uh, or sorry, Louis Vincent Gav has never let you live this down. And I just wanted to let you know that the third season is being taped and will be dropping on December 21st. <laughs> Oh my God, that, this is the best Christmas ever for me. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. You know what we should do? We should get, we, you should come to, I should go to Vancouver. You should go to Vancouver. We should go to Louis' house and we should watch it there. Binge it. <laughs> like get some. Like make, three girlfriends. <laughs> get, right. uh, get, get our shot at our vino. And uh, that's right. get, get <laughs> over the good looking French men <laughs> on the show. Yes. <laughs> Okay, the other thing I got to talk about is that you obviously, um, you talk a lot about the different uh, generations, and you talk about the the millennials and, and the Gen Zs and the Zs, you know, I, I'm a Canadian, I shouldn't say Z, um, the Zs, and then you talk about the boomers, but you're very careful to not talk about the Gen Xs, and first of all, is that because you're getting interviewed by one? <laughs> <laughs> No, you you have a youthful personality. So, so I, I feel like I'm almost a millennial. <laughs> yes. um, uh, but I, I do want to talk about you are a millennial or you are an elder millennial, I believe. you. If I'm not mistaken, you are the first year of the millennials or the second yeah, year? Yeah, that's about, yeah, about right. Yeah, you so you're, um, so I do have a bone to pick because you guys have the most terrible music ever. And it's just it's just bad. And you like those jeans that were really like wide and you just did stuff. And you talked about you said you had a presentation that was 1998 was the best year ever. And I'd love to hear why you think that. And surely to God, you can't think about it, about music. Well, I'm going to look. Yeah, I, I think as far as music goes, I, I, I'm not going to pick a pick the fight with you, uh, you know, that. There was some sort of a peak in, you know, probably like late 70s, early 80s, and and then it's been downhill. But I, I would still say, like, I, w- I would take the music of the 90s over the, the music of the 2020s. Uh, so we, we're doing better than, than that. Uh, I would say, though, on the, on the movie side, uh, we were, uh, you know, there was some sort of a golden age in, in, in the late 90s. There were, I, I think oh, that's it was true. A, You're actually right. right. Yeah, that's actually the... You, you know, the Tarantino of- movie, you got Fight Club, you yeah. got, um, some of the Kevin Spacey, Spacey stuff. Like, you know, you go back at that at that age, it, it was really good. And, and then, I don't know, it may be just, 
me, me turning into an old fart, but there was a, a sense of freedom, a sense of optimism, right? We, we had the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the end of history, internet. Like, internet was such a nice place back then. You could trust each other. I mean, it was not like none of these, you know, social media giants were there monitoring you, selling you data. Um, there was there was something, and then we had the, 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 the cheap, travel you know the, the in across europe you could take you know easy jet and you do your, your erasmus program in, in in ireland and make friends and i don't know maybe it's because i was young back then and then the world seemed like a happier place but i i do believe it's i i don't envy my my sons i think they they you know they, they will grow up in a world that's a, a lot less free and a lot less joyful than, than the one I, I got to experience well, maybe I think that every generation thinks that the current generation stinks and it's always yeah. not as good. And we always remember it. Yeah. But I'm, I am going to put you on the spot. Your favorite 1990s movie, because you're right. There were a lot of good ones. I have mine, uh, but I'm wondering what yours is. Um, I'm going to go with what I would have said at the time, which, you know, probably not I would say now, but, you know, I'm going to go with Fight Club. Oh, that's you know, good. I mean, for, for guys, you you know, oh, my God, like he. We want it to be him, you know, or yeah. his, his abs, his, his charisma and, and the, the mind twist and all that. And you don't have his it. abs? Uh, <laughs> no comment here. <laughs> I have my the six pack abs. That's where you take like the the, the plastic that you have on the six pack of a uh, beer and you put it up against your fatness and you pull it tight. That's what mine looks like. <laughs> I'm going to go with the big Lebowski. Oh, man. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I but see, it was more of an indie movie uh, at, at the time, at least. It kind of acquired fame later, but yeah, it's yeah, it's a fantastic pick, yeah. and, and you can watch it a hundred times, and it's still funny every it, time. I, I completely agree; it's awesome. All right, Vincent, uh, why don't you tell people about what you do, how they can find out more about your stuff? Give us the whole spiel. All right, so I am the uh, global macro strategist for StoneX. Um, StoneX is a uh, large uh, institutional uh, financial service firm, uh, broker dealer, FCM, um, and uh, what I do there is I um, I write uh, weekly reports. They're about eight to ten pages. I try to avoid the things that the street covers well. You know, the latest PMI release, trying to forecast earnings, and I try to focus on kind of big ideas that the market is not getting right. And one of them was, you know, inflation is kind of generational strife. Um, you can subscribe to my work by visiting my Twitter profile. Uh, so it's my first name and then my last name, Vincent Deliard, V-I-N-C-N-T-D-E-L-U-A-R-D. And if you go to my pin tweet, there is a link where you can sign up for a free trial of my work. Uh, and, and I try, I've benefited a lot from people on Twitter who you know have been able to have conversation with with very smart investors who who've taken the time to to answer my stupid questions. Uh, so I, I try to do the same, and I generally find the the interactions on Twitter to be very stimulating. Um, so um, that's the best way to reach me. No, oh, that's great. Well, Vincent, I, it's it's always a pleasure to have you. I am looking forward to our December twenty first date at the Louis Vincent Labs <laughs> house. I, I'm going to let him know. Uh, maybe we could do a little skiing afterwards. Uh, you know, the next day, but uh, it will be fun. And it's always if you don't mind waiting a lot for me, yes, because I am not following Louis Vincent on the slopes. <laughs> I, <laughs> Or I would be rolling, tumbling down the mountain. You know, what's funny is that he sent me some pictures of one of him skiing one time. And I said, oh, that, that guy looks really good. Is that, your, is that your guide? And he says, you're shitting me, right? That's me. <laughs> <laughs> and he does look like he can really ski. So I, I am uh, looking forward to someday getting out there with him. And uh, unfortunately, he's probably a lot better than me because he, he lives so close. He's probably doing it all the time. And, uh, and, and not only that, I think he has like teenage slash or like, like, boys that he has to follow around and i suspect that it's uh he's probably busy hucking himself off cliffs and things like that i'm sure well it'd be fun thank you so much for having me kev thanks a lot vincent take care all right patrick you ready for uh talking charts Uh, all right let's do it Okay, so but uh, before we actually get into uh, deep into the charts, let's review a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about um, uh, obviously things top to three watch. things to watch, and uh, uh, the first one was crude oil, and uh, I think it was pretty important. I think we yeah, chose especially it, today. Right? No, well, for sure today. Uh, but uh, what was interesting was that when we actually issued this, 
uh, crude oil was actually trading back, uh, down in the uh, low 80s. It was, uh, it was about a five-day pullback going on in, uh, in mid-October. And we were like uh, saying this is a pretty critical level where, you know, it was a make it or break it moment if uh, oil was going to turn. And uh, the bulls really had been grinding it higher, holding all the pullbacks, and then today. Like, it exploded uh, higher. Exploded well, we'll talk higher. more about today's action. Let's go. What was number two that we were watching? Uh, a uh, yeah, the central bank meetings. Obviously, uh, 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 it, we had all of them, uh, everything from ECB, Bank of Canada, uh, and, of course, uh, the FOMC. The, um, uh, it was, uh, uh, that one was oh. one for the ages, one for the record books. I don't even know why we didn't put it as number one now, looking in hindsight. Like, that well, was, uh, it's because someone yeah. chooses that one. Japan. Yeah. Yeah, we we were watching that Japan and that. Well, obviously the intervention came. Uh, oh, that's right. And I think you were just doing digs at me and putting it as number one because you knew it was going to hurt me the most. Yeah, it, for sure I was. There was definitely a, a, an agenda behind putting it there. But but what was interesting was is that ever since uh, like it, when when we did the show, uh, the, let me here put up the chart. That U.S. dollar yen was ripping higher, north of one fifty. And uh, it didn't take much, uh, too long for uh, that uh, intervention candle come in. Uh, and what's interesting is they had a failed rally. Like it, what, one of the things that was happening earlier in the week was uh, we put in that short-term low around 145 on the U.S. dollar yen. It turned upwards. It looked like it was going to be a deja vu of the last few times where they turned the market higher and went. But, the, you know, I think this is a bigger story of actually what's happening in the dollar. In fact, let's save it for um, when we get into a deeper dive in everything because what's going on in the inner markets is so interesting right now. But anyway, let's talk about the top three things to watch for the next couple of weeks. Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, well, f uh, the first thing that I wanted to highlight is Will this commodity breakout stick? Uh, and I don't, it, well, to be honest, when I, I said commodity, but it is um, a couple of the major commodities went. Crude oil, uh, gold, copper, silver, all turned up uh, pretty significantly. But uh, things like the grains have not really joined the party. Nat gas is not really doing anything like uh, it. Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess there was a pretty significant turn up in nickel prices, but that's sort of in that copper uh, kind of thing. Like a lot of those basic materials, iron ores all turned. But the big question for me, though, Kev, is, is that was this breakout? Is it going to stick? Uh, because it, to me, there was some serious technical advances actually we'll, we'll put up all these charts here in just a second uh but anyway that's my top uh number three thing to watch uh, what about yeah. number two what's there inflation when cpi numbers coming out uh, oh i think uh, that is huge yeah. I, I i don't think you can assign enough importance to that mm -hmm. uh, it, it's gonna be the make or break it, it'll be it'll set the tone <sighs> what, what's I, crazy is that it's only uh uh like a we're, we're just going to be realizing in, in, well, number one, let's just put number one in there too, the election uh, and the election results. So I would um, actually put, I, I obviously had nothing to do with this. Choosing so you would have put there. inflation over election? Oh, 100%. Okay. 100% is all that matters. Uh, so irrespective of one or two, the thing is, is that uh, what I find interesting is, is that we're only going to be getting the real kind of sense of the true election results in a small window before those inflation numbers come in, right? And and so it's going to be one big muddle. It's And what I find interesting is, is that I would argue that a lot of m the market trends have not committed because of all the uncertainties of all of these, everything from what uh, was going to happen from the FOMC, how did the job numbers come in, uh, how will the election results come in, what will the inflation number be? It's going to be like by Thursday of next week, all of it is going to be known. And what I'm going to be really watching is whether or not the market finally commits to a trend move. Like um, whether higher or lower, that would that finally this kind of like chopping around and just churning turns into a meaningful move. And you uh, think it's going to happen after those two events? Well, I just think that everyone who's going to commit big money before them. 
Like, uh, you know, like the, the way I kind of look at it is, is that it's like once those are behind us and there's clarity, it allows uh, some big money to be put to work either or, or taken off the table. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out. But I think the big moves happen off after the news. Well, the other thing that I think could happen is we could get a vol sale, meaning that we could get a uh, vol stay bid until then. And when you get that kind of relief, okay. Well, uh, let's okay. Stop. Let's talk about this. All right. Let's talk charts. Okay. okay let's let's start with the uh, the uh, S and P five hundred. Um, okay. So the actually the reaction the 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 big move uh, move uh, we're seeing in commodities and the dollar and everything that happened today didn't really move the needle on the stock market. Um, I mean, the, the, the stock market uh, in the post uh, FOMC obviously t- had some wind taken out of the sales, did a 50% retracement of the entire little October advance. Uh, and But what I found fascinating was we, we got hammered by a couple of days where we wiped almost 200 S&P points to the downside and the VIX is still declining. Yeah. Like, well, because uh, uh, the market is well supplied of that, and it's of okay. Volatile. Stop. Well, su- well supplied of what? Of of vol. Like okay, everyone, so you're, everyone, we're going we're going into the elections and inflation uh, inflation numbers and all this, and and you're like, who the heck is supplying the vol? Well, like, no, but the clients have bought all the vol ahead of time. In, in terms yeah. of that, and that's my point: is that we we've already there's nobody to bid it up in terms of because everyone already owns you so you're you're saying that everyone's already loaded to the gills of this shit yeah uh, everyone thinks that there was you know most people are bearish you know it's changed recently but if you think about like if you step back and think about it from a longer term perspective lots of folks are think that there's all sorts of risks they highlight the powell the cpi the election so everyone owns protection and so that's why that's not getting bid Okay, that's that's my two cents. I, that and a, you know, I, I you know what I, you're you're this. you're 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 certainly offering uh, a, a reasonable uh, kind of you're offering a reasonable story as to well, and what I think a, that I've watched our you know Jim Carson uh, from I can't remember the name of his firm, but he's the guru. We we've yeah. had him on the show a couple of times. I think he's saying similar type stuff that the market is well supplied and, and therefore we're not getting that kind of bid. I, I still know. think I still think it comes in. I think people give up on it after those two events. I think that is is well, as high. As- I mean, if the stock market uh, ends up advancing, for sure you're going to be right. Like if 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 the S and P is heading to uh, the the four thousand to forty two hundred zone, we're going to see a twenty vol handle. Uh, that that is something that uh, makes sense. Uh, like, uh, I mean, at this stage, with as much crazy shit that's going on right now, and we're at twenty four, of course, there's room for this thing to go lower. Um, you and know, I'm it, just saying that after the event, you get people that have owned protection, and they're like, "Oh, I don't need it. You know, it wasn't as bad as I thought. It's behind us." And yeah. and they sell, and then that's where you get a situation where you get the ball. Okay, but uh, so how do you uh, how do you kind of put the puzzle pieces together in your head when it comes to the idea that, okay, so fine, the S and P and the market, uh, is, you know, uh, could end up not crashing and all these different things could end up playing out. But the NASDAQ is so weak and the fangs are just being murdered. And you, like you, you, how do you kind of, uh, Tell yourself that story. You think that your fangs just don't matter anymore and that the Well, the no, market- it's not that they don't think that they matter. And I do believe that the fangs are going to be – I've said this forever, Patrick. The fangs are going to be for sale forever. They are going to continue to, to leak. Forever. Out. Ever not, is a long time. Okay. So they're, for many years, they're going to be for sale because they are overowned, overpriced. The whole – too many people own U.S. stocks. U.S. dollars too high. And when they, the people that have owned the fangs for years and de- in some cases decades, just take the Swiss National Bank. Go look at their portfolio. I was about to mention the, well, okay. the, 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 the Swiss that, Central that Bank. That is, yeah. in essence, what you're what – you're, uh, you should almost shoot against their, their, their portfolio. That portfolio will be for sale, and it will take years. They sent it up for years. They'll send it down for years. And people forget, you know, after the dot-com yeah. crash, those stocks leaked and leaked and leaked and well, leaked. For three and, years. Yeah. 
That's yep. what's going to happen here. Stop going to buy the the fangs. Stop going to buy the arcs and the those names. There's new yep. leaders. Go find the new leaders and buy those. Well, because yeah, like that's a secular resource story, right? Like yeah, and just find the you know or the financial or things oh, that are behaving. Oh, oh my god, what you don't like financial? The I like them. I think that they're trading oh, well. Jesus. Are they? Are they? Is that what's happening? Like, okay, you know what? Uh, I, I, you know, I, okay, I, I, I'm gonna admit it. I sort of poked around and read your piece. Um, <laughs> I, uh, it's I so may, funny I may. That you, 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 you I, it is like, a, like a terrible I, thing you did. I, I, I made a, like, co- I made a I, confession. I, you know what? I, I, I have a confession. I, I go to I, fans all the time. I, spend yeah, I, I have a three hundred. I, I have a three hundred dollar a week only fans habit, and every now and then I read Kev's piece. I'm not sure which is worse. <laughs> And so, and so, uh, I, 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 I don't know, like, you know, Kev, like we're in a situation where interest rates, uh, continue to like, I think that your idea is on one side that the long bond is going to get its face ripped off and that interest rates are going to continue to go higher. And the single biggest credit creating institutions that have so much dog shit credit with consumers being loaded to the gills in debt with that uh, that are going to be paying huge interest rates and mortgage rates that are way too high and and these are what you're going to get bullish i'm not even going to say bearish you don't even have to be bearish them it's just it's not a bull story it, it's like um okay. I, I i i was God. i it's a beta one story dude it, like no. they're they're gonna they you know what i, I look we we can make a bet. I don't think that your financials do anything different than the S and P. I think that you're going to go straight well, down. You know what? I, I think someone I know uh, or someone won the bet this week. And uh, given your opinion, I think that you're going to have to uh, kind of back that up in in a, in, a, in, a, in a couple segments. So we'll just leave it at that. Okay, we can. But uh, but I'm actually talking about a bet on a longer term, like year end, like uh, like uh, something. Some like okay, we can. Okay, still well, make listen. It. Can I just yeah, defend myself a little yes. bit? Yes, please, okay. please, okay. please, please. Okay, so. First of all, yes, no doubt about it. Rates are going higher. and But one of the things that is occurring is that the banks in end are putting up the rates that they charge their customers. And guess what's happening to the rates that they pay out in terms of their deposits? They're not going up as fast. So what you're seeing is that bank after bank is, is, is beating because the spread between their deposits and what they're charging is expanding. So they're making more money that way. Second of all, even though that rates are going higher and it appears that for if you were to look at it, you would say this has got to be terrible for the consumer. The reality is that the consumer is in a much better fiscal situation than most people appreciate. And this is the reason oh. that rates of having to go so high. I just I literally vomited in my mouth. Yeah. 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 A little rant. Well, whatever. Uh, like- so, um, you know, and I, I think you're going to look back and I think that they're uh, – uh, screaming by, I love the financials. I love them. No, I love I, them. And everyone I, hates them. The other thing I love about them, everyone uh, hates them. They all tell me how it's 2008 is coming and all this shit. And it's just like, okay, fine. Buck they are the, they are monstrously leveraged debt things in a period where, uh, where debt is becoming incredibly expensive. Okay. Could uh, be. Like, we'll see. Like it's oh, all I'm, no, no, listen, I'm actually not, bearish i don't i'm not looking for a 2008 crash all i'm saying is is that this narrative of why to be overweight or bullish them is as silly as going long home builders three months ago it's uh it, it's 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 so i'm actually so i so listen my home builder was the wrong call i didn't expect powell to be this this hawkish so i i, I, I will but, uh, I just think that it's going to be beta one. I'm not bearish them. I just think that they're okay. not gonna, you're not getting in the alpha. You might but as well just buy the it, index. But then by that argument, you, you could argue that you shouldn't own um, any of the resource names. Why is that? Because rates are going up and the economy is going to suffer. It's not, yeah, that much, but, it's but, not that different. It's not that different of an argument. 
Uh, but okay, but there's other factors such as the fact that if the, the dollar the, peaks and if uh, and if we see uh, so let's say we have a, a key reversal in in dollar trend and scare, resource scarcity is driving inflation. I think that there's still that's a much better bull case than freaking that the financials and their freaking spreads. Well, it's uh, the, the difference is that you're bullish on the one. <laughs> that's all the difference. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's okay. Go, so, keep going so your chart yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So let's talk about this dollar. Tune. Okay. I have. A, so you made your admission uh, that you uh, that you have a three hundred dollar um, a week uh, OnlyFans habit, and that you read my letter every now and then. <laughs> I am going to make my admission. My admission was that in my private channel for the the my letter, I said the other day we're all just currency traders. The other day, and. I got all sorts of flack saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save this for Patrick. I'm going to show him all sorts of people telling me that the fact that I'm admitting this is just uh, was a real problem. But you are correct. The, the dollar has never mattered more. Yeah. Like really, over the last kind of month or two, we should have just had U.S. dollar as the number one and never changed it. Because yeah. that's all that matters. If you can tell me where the dollar is going, I can, you know, I can tell you where the majority I, of the absolutely. assets will be. Yeah, you know, it's funny, but like my entire um, the macro backdrop from even the last decade has always made the U.S. dollar a centerpiece. And really, what we went through is a year or so where the U.S. dollar correlations didn't seem to matter, and the currency became more trade ranged, and and ever uh, and a lot of people kind of. Uh, you know, shat on the whole idea, but but really, uh, ultimately, it's such a force the U.S. dollar, and uh, and when you start seeing these types of trends, it just becomes the elephant in the room. Uh, it, it and and we're it, it's we're seeing it right now, and the single biggest macro thing to determine. Is uh, is there a intermediate high in the dollar? And I want to say intermediate high, because it is so ridiculously premature to be calling a major dollar turn, even though you um, feel that the dollar is way too expensive. I just still think it's too early to be. Uh, it, it. I think it's sort of like your bond calls in 2019. It's like you get. You're such a big picture thinker. You get that in the there's going to be a major turn in the dollar, but uh, but it doesn't mean that these trends can't last another year. Um, and so I'm not ready to call a major turn in the dollar, but one of the interesting things would be is that what if the dollar has put in its uh, high for the year? I mean, there's another couple months left, November and December. Like what if the dollar just is going to mean revert down to 105 uh, on the Dixie and consolidate? That becomes a huge tailwind for risk asset. Yeah, listen, I agree. And I, I, I'll just add a couple of things. First of all, although I agree with your analysis about how important the dollar is, we can also show it empirically that it's gone up in terms of the correlations. And Dean Kernat from Alpha Exchange has been tweeting this over and over again about how the relationship between the dollar and many other asset classes has just continually gotten stronger and stronger. Yeah. And just as an aside, um, I just want to say a big shout out to Sean and the Wet Bandits who gave me <laughs> properly, you know, raked me over the coals for saying that we're all just uh, dollar traders, currency traders now. <laughs> um, it is. It, I, and listen, we are. That, that's yeah. the reality is that it's going to drive everything. Uh, yeah. and, and the only other thing I would say in terms of the dollar and in, in, in what that's driving I would I would like to give a shout out to Louis Vincent uh, Gav, and I believe he did say it on that other podcast you cheat with mm. us on, right? Yeah. And uh, Vincent Delawald brought it up today in our in our meeting about the fact that Louis was talking about which is more important, which pivot is more important, Powell's or G's, and yeah. I think today showed that uh, that Louis's point is is spot on. Yeah, and for sure. For those the China who, pivot is, is is huge. Yeah, and it's really, you know, uh, you should go back and for those who uh, who who have trouble listening to the full uh, macro voices, <laughs> you should go back. 
<laughs> Sorry. I just couldn't resist. <laughs> and I will go listen to it. <laughs> I should go listen. There's a transcript. Okay, there's oh, a transcript. Okay. I, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Golden. Golden, I will go get the transcript, or I'll, or I'll just ask, I'll phone Louie up and try to get it directly from him. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyways, Louie deserves a big shout out, and you guys do too as well for the for that call and or for you having know, you know on. who uh, you know who uh, kind of uh, collaborated that was Ola Hansen when we had him on. Um, oh, did his, he say the uh, same thing? Oh, well, he was he he um, thematically was uh, echoing many of the same things in his own version of it, uh, and. Uh, and it, it really does, you know, put put that whole thing. This it's uh, it's it's so important. It's yeah. so important. It, when it, and how the China reopens, and and all you had to do was look at today's action to see the fact that mm-hmm. it offset everything that Powell did two days ago with all of this bearish or hawkish talk. Yeah. It was just it was instantly shot out the window. And I I I, I can't wait to see once they finally do reopen what's going to happen to these commodities because they've been ripping. And like, listen, while we're, we're talking about commodities, let's pull up a uh, copper and I know. Okay. We'll get to copper. Hold okay, on. Okay. I'll okay. Okay. Do, okay uh, fine. No, no, no. Fine. Fine. Well, I was going to say something uh, nice about you right here. Yeah. So yeah no, 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 let, let no, no, no. Look at this. Here we go. Copper. Okay. It is. Look. Okay. Here. So I think that, um, I know, I, I'm pretty sure you said it on our show, but I know you did okay. it with your big picture members. I was there when you started talking about copper and how you were constructive on it. And I would say, great call, buddy. It really was. It led the way today. It was the crack cocaine of the commodities. And we should, you deserve a lot of credit for being long that thing. And let's just hope it's the start of many more. Well, you know what? Uh, it's, uh, the one thing with today's price action, though, on the copper, and it's actually with many of these commodities, this is why I actually put it as number three on our top three things to watch, is because one day doesn't make a new trend. This was a great breakout candle. This is like um, the way I describe it in my technical programs and stuff. This is like someone shooting a starting gun. It's an advertisement to the entire trading community. Pay attention. Something's happening here. Come look. It's a big up day. And what what, um, is really important next week is to find out whether or not the starting gun blasting started a feedback mechanism of buying that starts the new trend. Because uh, we've seen it before where these kind of big up days happen, and then within a week, everything is faded right back down. And so while it's a very good day, uh, it's, and, and it could end up becoming the, the next bull, um, to me, next week is actually critical. Will the bulls follow through? Will they be able to build on uh, on a one really good positive day? Can they actually start to repair the awful, you know, uh, almost like nine month bear market that's been ravaging uh, copper? Uh, and can a new bull cycle begin from here? If it is, there's big freaking money to be made. Like this is like this is like first inning of a nine inning game kind of stuff. But could be even first pitch. First pitch, yeah, absolutely. But you, uh, you know, you, it, I think next week is the big tell. Like we have to see whether, like, you remember when silver had that big up day? Like, obviously, silver had a great breakout. But look at what happened in October, right? You had that same candle breakout happen right, right over here, back at um, uh, on the yeah. first uh, week of uh, October. And look at the way it faded it all the way back down. That's just what you don't want to see on copper. Like what 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 we need to see is is that uh, that there's that feedback and that that buyers are suddenly putting money to work and it's really attracting new flow, and um, and it could really be the start. I'm not I, I'm actually somewhat optimistic, but uh, I just one day doesn't make a new trend. I I need evidence, but it's high on my radar. Very important asset to watch. I'm watching copper 100%. Uh, and, and you know what? Those copper stocks have been behaving well for even lo- um, uh, even longer. Like look at this gap in the COPEX, the ETF for copper miners. But like, uh, but you know, Freeport McMoran had its positive earnings. Uh, it, it caused that, that, by the way, that's a good example right there. So look at uh, on that nice, beautiful breakout candle on its earnings that happened over here. Uh, notice that in the week after, it was r- relatively well accumulated and defended. 
That's literally what you want to see on all of these things that broke out today. You want to see a week where they hold in the gains, may push it to higher thing. You want to see pro, uh, positive accumulation showing on the charts. If that really shows up, the next leg of the commodity move may actually be here. Let's hope, man. Let's hope. <laughs> Someone's got too much of it there, obviously. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, but uh, let's let's talk all the commodities. I want to talk crude oil here for a moment. Like we started with it because that was one of the top three things. But this is a um, a really interesting moment. Uh, this pullback right over here, that when we highlighted it a couple weeks ago, was uh, a key Fibonacci retrace and a, a key moment because the pattern oil has had since its June high was sequentially low lower highs and lower lows in a very definitive downtrend. And one of the key things that we were looking for was will the pattern break, which is, is that uh, it stops making lower lows and generally is well accumulated. All of those patterns are here. We're now above all sorts of key moving averages. The ascending trend lines are being broken. You can, it doesn't matter how thick of a crayon you're using here, Kev. It's like it's a breakout. Uh, and um, and the, the, so the question now, uh, can we see constructive bullish price action get this up to the mid to high 90s next week and really definitively advertise to the market that the next bull phase has started? And what interesting part part there is is like obviously oil has been politicized obviously when you have uh, the existing administration uh, you know using the strategic petroleum reserve to uh, to kind of uh, it's a it's a blatant manipulation of oil to uh, because of a political agenda the question is once politics are behind and the SPR is no longer needed to be uh, used for that, will that suddenly reverse and actually become uh, uh, the fuel that actually even accelerates the bullish move on the upside of crude? Do you have an opinion on that? No, I don't. I like I. I don't. I. I'm. I'm. I'm constructive. I'm worried about the possibility of the SPR uh, being. Uh, that selling, you know, being extinguished and therefore we get a spike where, you know, but I, at the same time, it seems like a lot of people are hoping for that, calling for that. So we'll worry that part of it worries me. You know me, Patrick. I can't stand it when everyone feels the same as I do. So it, it kind of bothers me. But having said that, it really does feel like they've been trying to keep it down. And when you try to keep it down, you can do it for a while, but eventually you can't. Eventually you run out of ammo. It seems to me that they, that's where they're at. And now the real question is, how does it behave from here? Um, yeah, I don't know. You know what's the interesting part, though, Kev? Like, uh, was that while you could, let's say, keep, um, you could keep, let's say, energy down through something like dumping oil, like uh, through the SPR. But what has been clear is that the uh, traders have focused almost all their attention on energy stocks which um, are virtually about to make 52-week highs. In fact, uh, all time, not all, is it all-time highs? I'd have to put on a monthly chart to see where all-time high on this. No, not all-time highs. But, but certainly, we're in a situation where a 52-week high can happen here in the middle of a bear market where FANG stocks are, the, the FANG basket is down 48%. Off of its highs, and you know, and the leadership is here. I and completely thing, agree. Yeah, and, and 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 so the thing is, is that um, because of the nature of investors and nature of money managers, they have to generally, you know, in order to maintain assets under management, they have to be in the things that are working. And, and the question is, is that is this creating a feedback loop where people just have to now own the energy because that's the only thing that's working? I, that, that is what happens, and it, it's going to continue. And they're still cheap. That's the other thing, Patrick. These stocks mm -hmm. are still cheap. It's not like people are paying up for them. Because don't forget, no. how did they get here? They got here because people couldn't own them. Now, yeah. funny how kind of the world's changed over the last little while. But there was a period where you could not own them, not yeah. because they were they were um, not because they were cheap or behaving badly. You couldn't own them because you actually couldn't own them. You would get political pressure to not own these things. Yeah. Now that they're behaving a little better, people are finding excuses and ways around the political pressure. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, it is interesting that that is that they have done this and that they are still by no means an expensive group no. that people are reaching for. So even yeah. like it's almost like they're reluctantly being dragged higher. And the yeah. uh, the ironic thing is, Patrick, that they're making so much money, the companies are buying back the most of their own stock. That's yeah. where all the buybacks are happening, and that's why here in Canada, government is gone, and it's actually it, from their perspective. It's a great way to tax the uh, oil industry without really taxing the oil industry because they they've instituted a, a buyback on or sorry a tax on buybacks, wow. and it's a way of sneaking it in. It's a way of doing it. Uh, there you go, and uh, that's uh, interesting that they did that. I didn't know actually about that. I know because uh, you don't care about us anymore. Oh my God! All right. Anyway, but the other area, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna it's dodge that. that. The, the I'm guy, dodging. You, the I'm guy dodging. goes and gets some nice weather, and he he starts to enjoy not having snow on the ground. And next thing you know, he's not paying attention to any of the news here in Canada. Yeah. So, but yeah. one of, one of the other China stories is obviously iron ore, and uh, and uh, big gapping in the uh, the big iron ore plays. I'm gonna start with BHP, which had uh, literally gapped above its like two three week range on the upside but rio had a big up day uh, a valet had a big up day uh just uh, a a very distinct turn and this is another space that has been just so beaten down and the fact that uh, uh that we're sort of seeing these basing formations it's it's um it's interesting it's like the entire resource space is, it seems to just have a a, a a new life to it all of a sudden after what was a very very painful six month cycle in the being a resource investor um even or even like look at what's uh, going on with gold uh gold and silver um just like this is the i think the single biggest one update that gold has had in probably like a half a year. When was the last time we saw uh, an update of like fifty bucks? I don't. Th- it's been a while. Like it you have to been- go back. You have to go back to like February and March. It has been a while, and it's. Uh, I'm still off by uh, at least uh, 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 what I have to add a zero and then double it for my call for a week. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, coming. But it's coming. But 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 like look at that update on silver now what what i love technically on on things like this is is that when silver um uh it it stopped making lower lows basically uh in the summer right and i mean september it was at its low the late late august sorry and uh, every time they hammered, it, it ha- got hammered. It would, it's not like it felt good when you owned silver during that period, but it was actually being well defended along a key support line. Even like a fools like us that would say there's no such thing as a, a triple bottom would be like uh, sitting there uh, expecting the breakdown, but like it was very well defended. And we're going to get, uh, and this is why, again, it was number three on the list uh, in terms of top three things to watch. Can the bulls start to follow through on these turns? Like this, this could be first inning shit on all of these. First inning shit. That's like, uh, that's a that's yeah. new technical analysis. Uh, terms. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. By the way, uh, uranium, is that a buy on dip? Maybe. Maybe uh-huh. like yeah, it's been a such a positive trend, and every time we've dipped like this, um, even though it could still poke it down to sixteen fifty, I'm not trying to say it's already just upside, but but the pattern that uranium's been holding has been that every dip gets bought. What's interesting is obviously that that chemical news, which I I know you went uh, the other week, uh, you know, you made your opinion very well known to our our listeners. What did I say? Uh, Oh, that you were uh, you were bullish at, oh uh, yeah, yeah. But um, that you you thought it was uh, was silly that thing. But the point is, is it dragged the entire. Your oh, rain- this is oh. the new issue. The new issue they got uh, that yeah. they sold. What happened? Was I right or wrong? No, 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 no. I'm talking about Cameco with their takeover of, um, or not takeover the M and A. No, the activity. new issue. Yeah, they didn't. They did a big new issue, and they teamed up yeah. with Brookfield. Yeah. And the the new issue was down into the hole, and then it didn't. It, it had trouble. It actually broke below issue for a little while, and it was big. Uh, yeah. But since then, I think it's done well. Well, it it's, not? it's held up. It hasn't done worse. 
Uh, I mean, I don't like, I mean, fine. It's like five, 10% off of the lows, but like, I wouldn't like be going doing a victory lap around for that kind of a move yet. The point is, is that uh, what I want to highlight is that while uranium has done well as a commodity, you know, this, the, the spud has been generally uh, um, advancing, but what you have is scenarios where the uranium stocks uh, as an ETF and as a, as a group have actually gotten no love. Uh, the, the, you can see here we're using this uh, uranium X, uh, the global X uranium, sorry, ETF, that uh, it's still been in, in an awful trade range. And I'm curious um, if the whole resource space comes to life, whether or not uh, this uh, finally starts to get some action. Well, that's a good point. It actually, you're right. It's not... <laughs> It's not like that's leading the way, and it's especially today. It was actually underperformed. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. When I'm just, no, no. I'm just, that's just a thing that I'm watching. Like I'm not. Okay, you watch. Okay, I'm, fair I'm, enough. It's uh, like I don't. You know, we don't know whether it will, but it's certainly something to keep a, a really close eye is on. This, is this the Patrick I'm watching? Copper uh, heads up. It could be. It could be. It could I think be. it is. I. Uh, I oh, there you I, go, I, folks. Read between the lines. I, I, I don't want to be urinized. <laughs> <laughs> don't, 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 don't put, don't put don't urinize, put urinize on, on, on Patrick's uh, it's a, a picture. Twitter profile. No, no, don't yeah, do yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Well, you know what? It probably was, thinking back at it, when someone put housing eyes on mine, that was the end of it. Yeah, Think housing has gone straight down. Yeah, so don't then. don't gucher this one, everyone. Just yeah. leave it alone. We we let's just, let's quickly change the topic. Okay, what do we got uh, next? Uh, I well, what do you want to look at? Is there any? Uh, there, uh, this is something that you were thinking. I just really thought it was interesting how awful these Fang stocks are doing. Um, uh, but I'm not surprised. I don't know why I, people I are know, so surprised about this. They I suck. Know. They're over owned. They're going to continue to be for sale. Stop buying them. Like yeah. just go like you know what that like that Michael Jordan video from the like nineties or early late eighties where but, he but says Kev, when, he when he says Kev. when he's talking about drugs and he's like stop it do something else stop so Kev, buying fangs okay so Kev I won't disagree with you it's not like I'm trying to endorse the buying of the fangs uh, what what though I what I struggle with is on one part. I want to kind of like uh, believe in my mind that the S&P has room to rip 10, 20% on the upside if given the right bull catalyst. And I am trying to, uh, I can't seem to figure out like how the hell does the S&P make that kind of a move if the fangs are shit in the bed? Well, so, like, so here, okay, so I'll give you the answer to that. What you're going to find is you will have a rip in the fangs higher. But they will be the traditional bear market rally, meaning they will go up 10, 20% in one or two days, and then they will go back to leaking. And the other stocks will hang in there. Yeah. And this was, I, I think we've had this argument before that, that whether, you know, whether you could get a correction in the fangs without it crushing the whole market. Now, it happened to be that everything went down. So we're down 20% or 25%, and, and a good portion of that is the fangs. But I don't think you need the fangs leading it back to get us to, like, unch. Like, I could see us where we could get a rally in the fangs that just kind of makes them not look quite as bad, and then everything else rips. Maybe yeah. financials. <laughs> <laughs> Not impressed. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, but you know what? It it is interesting. Like consumer, uh, let, let's actually okay. Very briefly, let's quickly go through it. Um, like just interesting. Like for instance, the consumer discretionaries continue to be very weak. And um, and what was interesting to me is that while you uh, seem to have a little bit of a too much excitement about these uh, financials with the XLF with the the magnitude of the rise. Like when you look at it relative to the regionals, the regionals don't really look that impressive, dude. No, like, but they're uh, like, listen, if they're not, they, the, I don't know. All I'm just saying is, is that 
like when you compare that to um, some of the other areas, like, okay, uh, consumer staples, uh, they, I mean, you, okay, like the Coca-Colas and McDonald's have been like really working, right? And, but there's been a couple of things that have been dragging this down. But, you know, health cares have held up somewhat uh, reasonably during this time. But you have a scenario where it's really the tech space. This is the X, uh, the XLK uh, just continue to be the dog, right? But that it's listen, a, that's going to be the dog for yeah, yeah, two years, two years, just like in 20, 2000, it was the dog for a couple of years. Yeah, like like let's think back, like how long did Nortel but, but, leak lower and lower and lower and lower? Yeah, like, the, because because yeah, no, listen, with the inner like for instance, there uh, you know. Not all stocks were going down all the way into 2003, but the internet stocks kept leading, right? Like, yeah, yeah I, get, I get your point. And that's, like what, that's what's going to happen to the Fang Mat. It's going to be until, listen, so I'll tell you when you can buy the Fang Mat, okay? You can buy the last million shares of Apple from the Swiss National Bank, Patrick. <laughs> or, or, or when Kramer is selling. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we got to talk about this. Okay. Okay. So did you did like? First of all, why are you he, talking about his little Invi his, uh, he, Nvidia? When he was crying, when he was crying, oh, was it, uh, yeah, Nvidia. No, it was, it was it was it was Zuckerberg. Oh no, Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg it was yeah, yeah it was okay. Meta. So for those who don't know, uh, Kramer was very bullish on uh, Meta, and then he was completely surprised when they shit the bet. Okay, and he had this little mea culpa where he borderline broke down crying. Because Zuckerberg lied to him, okay? Now, first of all, I actually, like, Kramer, I don't understand the guy. He actually argues with people. Like, he, there was some guy that made the inverse Kramer index, and yeah. he started arguing with the guy and started telling him how, no, my record, blah, 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 blah. Like, that's not the way to solve that. You kind of joke and say, yeah, how do I short it? Because I want to double up on my bet and I want to earn your fee or whatever. You don't get into arguments with people, but obviously Kramer does. Um, so, but he's having his trouble. He's looking old. I really think he, he should just like retire because he does seems to be getting way he's too broken. upset about this. He's way too upset about he's this. He's broken. He's broken. Yeah, he's broken. Okay. But I do want to say one thing. Okay. He went through this mea culpa where um, he felt that Zuckerberg had guided him into believing something that wasn't true. And it took until the actual numbers collapsed that he went, holy smokes, the guy lied to me. This isn't the case. And then he was all upset. I don't want to name the stock. Don't name the stock. But there is another stock that has lots of people that believe this founder, not, no, wait, he's not a founder, this leader of this stock. And here is my prediction for you. I believe that the G Jimmy Kramer, I can't believe Zuckerberg did this to me, slash crying, will be occurring across the board and we will see tons of it and there will be calls for, I, I just don't know how this person could do this, why this is allowed, and this shouldn't be allowed, and there'll be calls for congressional hearings and a million different things. That is a precursor of things to come. Mm -hmm. Don't say the stock. Don't say it, Patrick. Don't say it. Okay. So It's, uh, it's going to happen, though. It's uh, like, oh, well, I shouldn't say it's going to happen. Okay. I think there's so, a high likelihood. A high, high likelihood. Uh I want to leave the talking charts with one quick thing. Uh, what was interesting was that obviously uh, China was the story. So commodity markets dollar seemed to be where the action was. But what was interesting is uh, this is the 10-year the treasury note, but both the S&P 500 and the treasury bonds um, really didn't seem to care today. And one of the interesting things for me is is that if we start seeing that uh, the dollar and commodities start moving in the weeks to come, was this just the fact that you know one day they didn't care, but 
they will start to care soon. Like, are we are we going to see a scenario where these things actually start making big moves because of the bigger intermarkets going into Fritz? Um, like into a little, uh, like uh, to me, uh, it's interesting that just we didn't see any real action here today. I, I will even take it one step farther, Patrick. I would argue that over the last little while, there's been a lot of money rushing into the U.S. because the dollar is going up, because they can earn positive yield in terms of with the higher rates. And there's been a rush of capital into the into uh, the U.S. assets. Financial U.S. financial assets have have benefited greatly from this move. One of the smartest fellows that I talked to told me one time because I was I was trying to make the argument that if you were a European pension fund manager and you were looking at your portfolio and you looked at your U.S. stocks, even though U.S. stocks were down 25 percent, you're really only down eight or five or whatever the number is or 10. And I said, they're going to start selling their U.S. stocks because that's they're not down as much. And he said to me, that's not how it works. He said something to the effect of when the dollar turns, that's when they will all rush out of their U.S. stocks. So it'll be difficult because there'll be different parts of this. We will see the stocks doing better because of the whole reflation of the U.S. dollar, and that'll occur. But at the same time, I think you will get flows out of U.S. stocks because of the dollar going down. And... This is why I think the fangs of mats, the fang mats of the world are trading so bad, because I think that's where the majority of foreign money is hiding. You think so, uh, this is the uh, emerging market renaissance, the moment? Well, where, you know uh, me. I'm always, I always love the emerging markets, and and you obviously don't read as much of my letters as you thought, or as you claim. Must have been because you were on the OnlyFans this afternoon. Yeah, but I did have uh, a piece that I wrote this <laughs> afternoon about an emerging market that I love. Oh, really? Yeah, I'll let you go figure it out. But anyways, is that it for okay, talking now charts? I, now, now, yeah, that's it for talking charts. All right. But I'm gonna, okay. now I have to go and like look and at actually the read emails. It. Yeah. Oh, my God. All right, I'll do it. Yeah. Okay. I'm still cheaper, a lot cheaper than your OnlyFans uh, have it, though. <laughs> All right, time for skin in the game. <laughs> and this is an exciting one. Oh, my I God. Thought, I thought I had lost. I really thought I had lost. Tell us the bet. Oh well, okay. Well, we bet uh, that uh, the th- on the thirty-year yield, and it was a close over under uh, for uh, at four and a quarter, and uh, I was winning the uh, majority of the two weeks. Yeah, and it literally was at three thirty, a half an hour before the market closed, and obviously there's after-hour price action. You uh you came in with the the strong finish and you uh you you me. I I got I have something to say though. Do you know how many fucking bonds I had to sell to get the yield up there? <laughs> how many did? Like uh, you know, like I, pride I, and ego. I sold half it was a worth fucking it. yard. It was worth I it. sold half a fucking yard and now I got it there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I went. So <laughs> I mean, so you sold half a, uh, a, a no wait, not a half a yard but half a fucking yard. So <laughs> Lena. Lena, how many points did half a fucking yard buy him for this? Four points. <laughs> four points. <laughs> it was an important four points, though. Okay, let me tell people about our skin in the game. It's our weekly opportunity for us to demonstrate that we are degenerate gamblers at heart. Every week, one of us presents a wager, and the other guy chooses which side of the bet he wants. Every wager needs to settle by next episode. And the rules of the game are as follows. We play a match to 50 points. The loser of the match will have to take out three lucky or unlucky, as how de- uh, depending on how you think about things. Market had a listeners for dinner where they get to grill him about why he had so many bad calls. All right, Patrick, it's my turn, right? Yeah, so it's we're your gonna turn. Have to do, we're going to have to do XLFs. Like, we got to right. do it after you do it. Now, the only question is, you're talking all this shit about the relatives. So I'm like... But the thing is that, um, can you do me a favor? Could you do XLF divided by spider so that I can see yeah. what the, like how much, because I'm worried there's that the beta on the XLF is less. Oh, and then in that market is I'm just going to lose because basically the XLF won't go up as much as the spiders. So I might have to do something else. Okay. So wait, that's XLF over spiders? Yeah. And you're giving me a hard time about this? Look, dude. Look no, at this, listen. Look at this chart. Okay, so tell me, 
This thing is in a huge bull market. I don't want to do this. This is like it's on a stick. This is the greatest. It went from point eight to point nine. You're getting excited about silliness. Now listen, make your bet. Like what's what's your move here, punk? Like you're <laughs> I'm gonna stick by my 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 call here. Okay, fuck it. I'm gonna stay up up or down from here on the XLF over the spider. Over the spider. Yeah, like meaning divided okay. by yeah, like this ratio. Oh, no, absolutely, absolutely. I'm gonna take under. Okay, I probably should have. I probably blew that. I probably should have asked for something. But anyways, okay, so be it. I'm gonna live with it. And, and listen, I'm not gonna do any. Okay, so I, what's let, the score let, let's, now? Let, the score is now you got twenty to uh, you got three points on me. That like fuck, I would have had you twenty four to nineteen. Yeah, but listen, it was an exp- it was expensive. For me. I, you beat me by like the hair on your teeth. In on my just, teeth, <laughs> on your hell? teeth, your teeth have hair, and and it like literally what? yes. <laughs> Your teeth have your teeth don't have hair. Yours though, and it, <laughs> and you beat me by that. Now listen, okay, you uh, listen, okay. I'm not gonna cry about it. You beat me. This is this is it. We've got we've we've got it right here. We're you're, marking it right listen, here. Okay, that's fine. Listen, you, the listeners are never gonna let you forget the fact that you, <laughs> that, that that you have, have teeth have hair. Teeth your hair. teeth have hair. No, 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 that's not that. everyone else. Listen, it's just yours. Just, when you say something dumb, it doesn't just make it less dumb to go. No, no, your teeth have hair. <laughs> Okay, it doesn't matter. It's, 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 I, okay, I, I, I'm gonna just to piss you off. I'm only doing two points. I'm not letting you get back to no even. three points. No, nope, I'm just telling you, you're you can do one if you want. So you one or two. So you pick. Fine, two. Oh wait, you know what? The, oh no, no. Let's do two. Two it is. Two it is. I was gonna say we got to start betting more to get the thing up, but it's okay. We're gonna we'll have the uh, two it is. We're gonna be at fifty, and we'll maybe we'll do it in the spring. All right, I drew the line in there. Okay, uh, for for today's. So, close. Can, can you? What is the ratio? Tell Lena. Well, uh, no, but the problem it's like point nine. Problem is, is that this stupid ratio is like the on trading view. Like, yeah, I don't know if you have a better way to do it on the. Well, the you board. know what we'll do? We'll use the we'll use the last prices of the two stocks. We'll list those and then we'll figure it out. We'll do it. We'll yeah. do the math by hand. But, no, but like we can just look it on. I the hear chart. people like, with I hair drew- on their teeth are really good at math. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's get on to the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, please save us, Lena, with some no stupid where you questions. Got hair on the teeth, I know, I, and then he just the best part was he just said, "No, you have <laughs> hair on your teeth." I, I double down, triple yeah, down. Exactly. <laughs> something your six year old would do. Somebody okay. a bit of a uh, no there. stupid questions, Lena. All right. uh, what's the first one? So our first question. Um, I would love to see you exhibit your trading skills by having the skin in the game use open bidding of points to take the position. Is that an adjustment you can make so we can see your trading skills on display? Oh, what does that mean? I don't understand uh, uh, that. It just means that there's hair on your teeth. And then you, <laughs> <laughs> then you have to like bid on it. No, it, it's... But seriously, how should a smallish retail investor view securities that embed derivative positions? I am looking specifically at tickers Eyeball, IDIV, and Wheat, and what place they should have in a portfolio. Well, Patrick, right. I'll let you do this one. Well, okay. You well, know, first, because, of all, first of all, because like, this is the kind of stuff you talk about at... Uh, okay. Big picture trading all the time, about managing well, risk this, and all that sort of stuff. Okay, jazz. well, first of all... Um, the average investor doesn't easily have access to some of the derivative products that are built into these ETFs. And yeah, well, first of all, something like wheat is simply using, uh, you know, grain futures to put on um, that. That's not the same as Ival, where, you know, uh, Nancy Davis is putting on steepener, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, derivatives to, to try to kind of uh, put on, Position so there. Each one of these are uniquely different. Point uh, I would make is simply uh, if you're looking for a certain type of an exposure, so, uh, and not everyone can uh, go and open an ISDA account. Uh, you there are certain uh, ways you can access your thematically what you're looking to accomplish through one of these products. Problem is these products are often complicated. 
and sometimes don't uh, do what you expect them to do. I mean, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, you're, they're, they give you what you want sometimes, and sometimes it's more complicated. Uh, I, I, I'm, I don't hate them. Uh, you just have to do a little bit of homework and make sure it's the right fit for your portfolio when you, when you put one of these on. Do you, you want to add to that? No, that sounds great. All right. <laughs> Num- next question. Next question. Hey, guys. Love the show. While I'm sad to hear you guys are going bi-weekly shows, I think my wife is going to appreciate the week off. <laughs> <laughs> That's us looking out for wives everywhere. I was wondering- and, and the three husbands that, of the three women that listen. <laughs> Thanks, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you guys had any advice for a newer trader on risk management after spending the last couple of years lurking Fintwit for trade ideas and macro resources. I am always hesitant to implement ideas because I don't feel like I have learned proper risk management. Are there any good resources for people like me who are very interested in trading but don't feel like they have a solid, solid foundation in managing risk? Patrick, is this not what you do for a living? Oh, yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> big uh, picture trading. There you go. Exactly. Uh, this is the, uh, sort, the, the, sort the of shameless thing. plug. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the, um, but, uh, you know, that, that actually is uh, the very art uh, because, you know, doing all sorts of macro analysis and, and finding opportunities, uh, you can always find a story as uh, something that's hot, something that's interesting. But the, um, the art of being good at this is finding asymmetry in those opportunities, right? And where, where can you enter, uh, manage the risk effectively, know how to manage through a trade? That's actually what separates, uh, you know, uh, the, the beginning trader from the more intermediate to advanced trader. And that's a very important skill. It is I, actually... I think- I think it's a skill that that is not talked about nearly enough. There's everyone talks about different themes, uh, different trades, and not enough people focus on the managing risk, dealing with it, setting up trades. Obviously, this is the, this is the sort of things you do with your options and your and different things like that. But it is really like it. Uh, I can't tell you enough how often I'll see people that literally ideas who aren't that good. Like they really aren't that good. They make way more money than the fanciest sounding guy on FinTwit that, that you come out of that going, great, that is so awesome. But then they don't make a dime. And you hear that story over and over again that uh, that uh, that just because someone sounds good doesn't mean that they make money. It's actually yeah. – and it just goes to show you how important the other pieces are. Yeah. And they're underappreciated, and you should continue to go resource, uh, go look at things and get, you know, give Patrick a call. Anyways, next one. <laughs> Hi, Patrick and Kevin. During last week's char- uh, Talking Charts, after the excellent Dean Kernard interview, you two touched on an interesting topic that seems worth understanding in more detail. How much is FOMC policy dictated by the chair versus member consensus? Open-ended discussion, welcome, but here are some prompts. Can the chair push through policies unilaterally? How much power does Emperor Palpatine have over the other members? <laughs> Can he fire them? Oh, my God. That is such a good line. Emperor Palpatine. That is so good. Um, this is a great question. And uh, in terms of the FOMC policy, uh, the chair versus the other ones, I do not believe – I think that they all have the same vote. So it has to go past through a majority – so by that measure, the, the chair doesn't have that much extra official power. What the chair does, though, from my understanding, is that they will call up um, uh, FOMC board members ahead of time and figure out where they're standing, how they're leaning, how they would feel ver- of this versus that and those things. And usually when they go to the meeting, I, I believe that they – know how everyone's going to vote. So they have worked through uh, disagreements ahead of time. And sometimes the disagreement will be like, I don't, I'm not going to agree with you. I'm going to, I'm going to abstain or not abstain. I'm going to, you know, be a dissent. And that's something that, you know, then Powell will go back and say, well, what would it take for you to not dissent? And they go back and forth. And it could be that he just says, ah, you know what, screw it. You're gonna, we're going to live with you dissenting. But in terms of the actual power that the, that the chair has, it, it is not as great as you might guess. 
but yet the power of controlling the meeting and then setting it up ahead of time, it ends up being a bigger deal than everyone expects. Now, can the chair fire FOMC board members? I should probably look this up, but I do not believe that he can. I don't believe that even the president can fire FOMC board members, meaning the president of the United States. But I do believe that the president can go and demote the chair to a regular board member at any time. So the Fed chair serves as chair at the uh, kind of, uh, what do they say, at the, the pleasure or discretion, I can't remember what the word is, of the president. In reality, I don't think it's ever happened. I'm not sure how much of it is how much of it is being threatened behind the scenes, but that is how it works from there. Um, can the Fed push through uh, policies unilaterally? No, the Fed cannot. The Fed chair cannot do that. Um, and then uh, I guess that's it. I, I, I think go. I answered it. I think so, yeah. You nailed it. All right, <laughs> last question of the week. Hey, guys, I recently took a look at the FedWatch tool that supposedly predicts the odds of the next rate hike. It claimed there was nearly a 96% chance that the next rate hike would be 0.75% or higher. This seemed a little high to me, so I started looking into how they come to such a number. I then discovered federal funds futures, which, which on the one hand seems like a very interesting product to reference, but on the other hand, I completely don't understand. Could you guys explain what on earth federal funds futures actually are? What is being bet on when someone buys or sells a federal funds futures contract? And for bonus points, how does the FedWatch tool glean a prediction from the Fed funds futures? Oh gosh, tongue twisters. It seems like the futures would give you enough for an over-under on the next rate hike, but I don't see how you could mathematically pull a prediction like 96% chance of at least a 0.75% rate hike from just the month just the monthly fed funds futures contracts thanks as always and i just wanted to give you guys a heads up that i can eat a lot of steak <laughs> <laughs> okay this is a go great question and i'm gonna i'm gonna give this to all um so let me just go through them one by one um what can you guys explain what on earth fed fund futures actually are okay the fed funds futures do not expire into uh, an actual underlying securities like a treasury bond future might. Treasury bond uh, future will expire into a various issue, and there's some complicated uh, things with the delivery. But in essence, you will, if you take delivery of a Fed treasury Fed, uh, treasury bond futures, you will you could theoretically get long an actual bond. In the Treasury and the Fed funds futures, it is an index. So it is, in essence, um, a way of betting on the Fed funds futures. Just like the S&P 500 future is the same way. It's an index. You can't take delivery of your S&P 500 futures. But what you can do is you can go and let it expire. And that expiry is based upon the opening price of the in, of the 500 stocks in the index. So theoretically, a sophisticated client that would want it to get long S&P 500 stocks could buy a future, wait for it to expire on the expiry morning of that triple witching, go out and buy all 500, prices, all 500 stocks, achieve the index price, and in essence have locked in the price of that basket ahead of time by buying the future. So... That's the first thing about the Fed Fund Futures. It's an index. Now, the next thing about it is when you compare it to, like, let's say, a euro dollar, which is a euro dollar is the it, it, it expires into three month LIBOR, which is another index rate. And it's very similar in that it's an index and it expires uh, depending on what that rate is at a particular time. The, it's different in that the LIBOR one has a one time settlement. And it'll be the 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 on expiry date. It's whatever LIBOR settles at. Whereas the Fed fund futures is actually the average of the total uh, the the traded Fed funds over the month of the contract. So if Patrick goes and we do a trade, and let's say I buy from Patrick a contract at ninety six. Uh, and he sells it to me, that implies a rate of 100 minus 96. So it would imply a rate of 4%. And if we go and look at all the days of the month that we trade, they'll take the Fed funds where they actually traded on those days. 
and we we averaged them all out. If it ended up being four hundred one, I would go depending on who did it. We would we would, in essence, someone would have won or lost one basis point times the, the size of the contract. I can't remember. I think it's actually a fairly large contract. It might be a million dollars. So, um, and, and anyways, the it ends up being that that's the important part is that it's it's the average of the Fed funds over that month. So why it gets a little complicated is that when you're going and looking at the odds of the Fed funds, or sorry, of a, of a rate hike, you need to incorporate the fact that if the rate hike comes out mid-mark, mid-month, you need to look at the fact that half of the month it's going to be before the hike, and then half of the month it's going to be after the hike. The next part about it that gets ends up being a little more complicated is that everyone thinks that the Fed funds is uh, a rate that is gets um, it's uh, precise, and what the Fed funds is actually is a lower and an upper target band, and usually I think it trades. I can't remember exactly. It's I think it's twelve. It trades roughly in the middle, twelve basis points above the bid or whatever of the lower bound or 13 below the upper one. But it's still not precise. There are days where it might trade one or two basis points higher or one or two basis points lower. And then there's sometimes month-end points where it will go to the actual bands, I mean, sorry, the the lower target or the upper target, depending on which way it is. So it's never uh, exact. That There's always a certain amount of risk that you need to assume with the fact that the Fed funds is going to, the actual contracts are going to, the, the Fed funds themselves are going to trade within a certain amount of a band that way. Now, what was the other thing? Um, oh, the bonus points. I need the bonus points. I'm always interested in bonus points, so I'm going to answer this question. How does the Fed watch tool glean a prediction for the Fed funds futures? Well, okay, if this is the one I think it is, it's on the CME website. I believe that a lot of the STIR traders, which is short-term interest rate traders, have complained that that doesn't do a very good job, that the math is wrong and that, that, that that's not very good. I believe on Bloomberg that it's better. They've figured out the math. But in essence, what they do is they make assumptions for where Fed funds will trade relative to the band. And then they just figure out how many days and then they figure out where it's trading. And yes... If you know all those things, you can then say there's a 96% chance that it'll trade here because it's at this level. And, and so it, it ends up just being math. Anyways, all I right. hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, no. That... It, 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 but, but the I key, there's, there, there's two main keys. One is that, you, uh, that the Fed funds does not trade on, or, uh, on the upper or lower bound. It trades in between. And then the second one is that the Fed funds future is not a point in time. It is the average over the of uh, the month of the contract. There you go. Lena, uh, if people have questions and want to submit them, where can if they submit them? If you have any questions for Kevin and Patrick, please submit your questions to no stupid questions at marketaudle.com. And make sure you send some side effects. We're always yes. looking for side effects. All right. Thanks for tuning into the Market Huddle. We appreciate you spending some time with us. Please give us a follow on Twitter at the Market Huddle. Uh, Patrick, uh, and, uh, Lena gets tired of talking to Patrick and myself. You can listen to a Market Huddle on all the networks. You know the deal. Uh, Patrick, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Patrick Ceresna or uh, at BigPictureTrading.com. Kev, where can they find you? You can go check out my newsletter at TheMacroTourist.com. And listen, we can never have too many friends. Bear market, bull market. We're just happy to spend some time together on this crazy ride. Now stick around for the after show. All right. Yeah. So, how is your beer that uh, is a tongue twister? The well, the uh, backwoods bastard is uh, <laughs> great name. Good the, picture. The ale ale aged in oak bourbon barrels. It's um, it's it's actually a great beer. Like uh, I uh, I wouldn't. I'm just. I'm actually just surprised by uh, how unique of a, a profile it is. It's. Um, it's, you don't run into beers that have this type of a, a taste very often. Uh, it's still great, though. Actually, I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, I j- you I'm also don't to- run into beers that put Gandalf on the front. 
Yeah, no, it's true. That does and look like that looks like Gandalf has gone a little he, dark in terms of like drank too many beers, and that's what it looks like. What I'm, what I like, usually I like to kind of rate beers based on you know whether it's an IPA or a thing. Like I just, I, I'm trying to like figure out where to put this in the whole spectrum. You know what? I'm, it's a good beer. I'm gonna give it like an eight point four. Like it, it, it deserves a good score. It should be tried by anyone who can who can try it out too. So it's not sessionable, but it's delicious. It's not sessionable. <laughs> it's been a while since you talked about it being sessionable. It's We're an American all... beer, but we can't oh, find it, it here. I don't think it's not listed in LCBO. Are you yeah. in America, or did you smuggle it into Portugal? America. No, I, w- I got it from. Uh, I was in Seville, Spain. And you got uh, it from Seville. Okay. Yeah. So did you like Seville? Because I have something to say about Seville. I went there when uh, when I was so kindly lent me your place in Portugal. And then we were going around and uh, my son wanted to see the monkeys on Gibraltar. <laughs> I think they're actually apes, but they look like monkeys. So we drove all the way there. And then on the way back, we had to get dinner. And so we went to Seville. And first of all, I must say, do you not think that it is Paris beautiful? Yeah. Oh, it's stunning. Yeah. Like, I, it's got to be. It's a, it's a, it's a, absolutely. So yeah. I've never been to the other, like, that's my first time in Spain. So I haven't been to Madrid or Barcelona. Are, is, is it, are they as nice as, as beautiful as Seville? Uh, so I, I actually, uh, em- embarrassing, have not been in Madrid yet, but I've been to uh, Bilbao and, uh, and Barcelona. And, uh, you know what? It, I would, <sighs> Seville, Seville might be better. Yeah, it like, is. but you know what? But you know what? Listen, uh, Barcelona has so many really cool things about it, right? No, no, I, I'm just talking about beauty. Like, I'm just saying, you yeah, drive in, you they, look. They, they, they really kind of uh, did the city right. The Seville. Terms. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't believe how gorgeous this was. It was gorgeous. Yeah. Like, it really, truly was. And like, because I think Paris is the most beautiful city in the world, and. I didn't think I would ever find something that compared to Paris in terms of beauty. And I was like, oh, my goodness. This is every yeah. bit as nice as You know, there's there's all these nuggets. Like, there's places in Italy and places. Like, yeah, so I, uh, Euro- not, Europe, Europe is. Uh, I know. Is, I haven't uh, traveled yeah, very so, much, so I am a little bit. Yeah. Of, uh, but you know North what? But definitely. Oh anyway, gosh, I was in make Seville. Somebody's going to make a poster, Kevin in Paris. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Kevin I met, in Paris. There you go. Yeah, yeah, no, and so uh, yeah, I had a, had a great time out there, and uh, it was it was good, and yeah. Did I yeah. tell you my story when I drove to Seville? Did no. I tell you guys this? No. So my daughter picks a restaurant, puts it into the old Google Maps. Dad's driving. We've got a Jeep Commandeer or something, Commander or whatever it is. Like not a small. Like, listen, by our standard, not a very big SUV by their standard monster um and it just starts taking me on this route and next thing i know i'm in the one way crazy tiny streets in the middle you know like in the middle where they go those streets that were made a thousand years ago Mm -hmm. that only the local cabs drive in and i and i i literally couldn't like it was so tight patrick and lena it was crazy and then i got lost and i was trying to find my way out And I couldn't find my way out, and I got out to try to ask people, and most of them didn't speak English. I speak no Spanish. So I'm basically gesturing with my hands, little road, big road, little road, big road. My kids are in the car busting a gut laughing at their dad, like, like showing pictures of like basically doing the fish thing with his hands. Eventually I found this really nice uh, fellow that spoke enough English to understand what big road meant and how I wanted to be out. And he, he led me out on the old, uh, he, he had a moto a motorcycle or whatever. And he led me out, but it was, it was a very traumatic experience. I was pretty sure I was going to scrape along the wall and, oh. and, and get brought up uh, in, in for charges at the UNESCO heritage site after crushing <laughs> something. <laughs> Thousand year old building, <laughs> but you know what? It's it's absolutely you know what? Kudos to uh, to Europeans who have mastered the art of parking in the fucking smallest spots <laughs> that I've ever fucking seen in my life. Like, the, the, and you know, like, and it's not just like you know some you know thirty year old that knows how to drive and this thing. No, there's like little grannies that are fitting fitting into these like parallel parking spots that like in North America, like uh, it, it it would the average North American wouldn't have a clue. I mean, I, I I'm watching this. I'm like, 
how the fuck well, did they do this? Like, it's, but Patrick, your place, Patrick has a place and he has a he has a place to park. So he says, oh, it's down here, and he's like at the bottom of this parking lot, and I go down there. And literally, I'm like, you know, in Austin Powers, when he does that, you know, <laughs> million yeah, yeah, back turn? And forth. <laughs> I was literally like Austin Powers <laughs> trying to turn this thing, and I couldn't believe it. I was like, what the hell? But but that happened to me in Seville. I, but like, uh, there was like, I got into this underground parking, and there was one spot, and it was literally just the width of the car, oh. and I parked so close to the driver's door. I, there was Look literally at how you no. Get out once you you rolled down the window. No, but the whole point is, is that <laughs> like I, I, it was beside a pole, so I was able to open my door enough for me to get out. But the car beside me on the passenger oh, side, wow. it, like literally, there was no more than like three or four inches between the two cars. Yeah, uh, I had to literally fold the mirror to get in there. And I'm like, look, I paid for this parking spot, and this is the only spot <laughs> I have to go in here. But like, like they. It's unbelievable. I, you know, it, every single European on this show is just laughing at us. Yeah, absolutely. Stu- stupid North Americans. That's what happens when say. you drive a Hummer for too long. Exactly. <laughs> that was the, well, like I'm, literally. I think I know oh, Patrick. Now, now, I, I know now Patrick every to, every car is small, so yeah. it's easy. So I know Patrick like two weeks, maybe, maybe three weeks, and I and I go take the subway, and he says, "Oh, I'll pick you up at the at the place," and he says, and he says, "I said, what will you be driving?" He says, "A white Hummer." I thought he was kidding. <laughs> No, nope. he shows up in his white hammer. Like I was like, oh my! And this isn't like this isn't like 1998 when these things were cool. This is like 2019 when these things have been outlawed because they take so much gas. <laughs> I'm Every, not dick. I'm not dick. You have to look around before you're getting into the car, right? It was crazy. That was just so funny when he drove this thing. And you're so oh, it's a funny car. Well, anyways, I'm glad you had a good time in Seville. Yeah, country. yeah. By the way, okay, so I want to change the topic here for a second here, okay? So um, in in my defense, in my defense, uh, I I googled the uh, hair on hair on the teeth. Oh, Oh, God. And and uh, and so in in Dutch, uh, you uh, you have uh, hair. um, If you have hair on your teeth is is a symbol of when you are strong, very strong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so and, listen, and, if you say any nonsense, there's going to be some culture somewhere <laughs> that's got something. Like this is you. You're going to say that your Dutch grandmother. You know, this is why you did this. Oh, I. You know, I knew that. There was and, like, uh, and an Italian woman has a rare condition of having hair growing out of her gums, and that her teeth are covered in. Yeah. <laughs> That is disgusting. I'm sorry. That that, that is like, uh, <laughs> you know, when you've been drinking too long and you wake up and then like uh, you you're kind of you go to, you pass out in someone's house and then like when you were a kid and then you'd wake up the next day and you'd be like, oh, that like, like fuzz on your teeth. Yeah, Ugh. I re- I remember the one time oh, the one God. guy cracked me up the most. One of the guys says he's doing that. And he goes, "Where's the rabbit?" <laughs> I go, what? What, ra- what rabbit? And he goes. The one that shit in my mouth last <laughs> night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Okay, on that note, why don't we call it a night? <laughs> All right. It's not giving me nightmares. Hair on your teeth. Hair on All right, teeth. we'll see I'm everyone in two weeks' time. It'll Take be, care. Uh, it'll be good. Good luck out there. Watch the U.S. dollars. All that matters. <laughs> <laughs> Catch you guys. Okay, bye-bye. All right, have a good one.